liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Uh, we have Spanish translation tonight. Yes, we do. Vivian Rodriguez, would you please introduce yourself? Sí, buenas tardes y bienvenidos de parte de la Junta Directiva del Distrito Escolar de Santa Bárbara. Si hay alguien que necesita la ayuda de un intérprete, por favor, levante la mano para darle un audífono. Gracias. Gracias. We have headsets for the hearing impaired, as noted on the board here. Um, if you need some, please let us know. Uh, announcements of closed session. We had a vote on the... Uh, to approve the Casey waivers for graduation for students with disabilities. Uh, the motion was by Parker, seconded by Cordero, and it passed 4-0 with Harder absent. Uh, acceptance of donations. Move to approve with appreciation. And you see that the total is $56,000 together with the $25,000 in donations to the theater department at Santa Barbara High School. Oh, yes. Second. Uh, motion by uh, Harder, second by Cordero. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Passes 5-0. Introductions, proclamations, presentations, or recognitions? Well, we do have two presentations tonight. First of all, I'm very pleased to introduce our new director of special education, Anissa McNeil. Anissa, would you please come forward? Let me, t let me brag on you a little bit before <laughs> we give you a chance to say anything. Anissa comes to us from the Mountain View Elementary School District, not in the Mountain View on the peninsula, the Mountain View in El Monte, California. She was a CEO and owner of Education Works. She has an extensive background in early childhood education and, of course, in special education. Anissa has a deep understanding of special education law and implementation, speech and language evaluation and therapy, professional development training, and early childhood ed education. She's very passionate about the needs and the potential of students with special needs. And as I called references and, and checked on Anissa's background, they all had the same wonderful things to say. Ms. McNeil is completing her, doc her Doctorate of Education in Organizational Leadership at Pepperdine University. She has a master's degree in Educational Administration and Leadership from Point Loma Nazarene University in San Diego and master's degree in Speech Language Pathology from Cal State Fullerton. She earned a, a bachelor's degree in Communication Disorder from Cal State Los Angeles, uh, Nisa McNeil. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Distinguished board members, to our superintendent, to everyone in attendance at this board meeting, I want to say, it, indeed, it is my honor and a privilege to accept this appointment as the director of special education. I'm excited to be a part of the Santa Barbara School Districts. I do believe that in special education, there is a world of possibilities. So I'm excited to be here. I thank you for your time, and I look forward to a long-lasting relationship. Have a great evening. Thank you and welcome. And do you have someone to in, some some to introduce there? Oh yes. I, <laughs> we have family. And they, and they say behind every person there is a multitude of cheerleaders. So I want to introduce to you the most outstanding people in my life. And I'm going to start with my two sons. I'm going to start with my youngest, Randolph McNeil. Randy, please stand. That's my son. And this is my oldest son, Bryce McNeil. And then I have a lifelong friend. Her name is Miss Keisha Mitchell. Keisha, would you please stand? And then I would love to introduce to you my left hand and my right hand, my brother and my sister, Mary and Cecil Woods. Truly without them, this would be possible. Thank you all very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good. Our other presentation is someone who's new to our community as well. We treasure our partnership with the Santa Barbara Museum of Art. There are exhibitions and events for students and staff add a rich dimension to the education of our students. I was at the Museum of Art just the other day as they were doing an, 
uh, a very labor-intensive project on a table in front of the Monet's on the wall behind our students. It was an, an incredible sight. I'm pleased to welcome and introduce Larry Feinberg, a renowned scholar and curator who became the museum's new director. Larry began his position on March 1st. He comes to Santa Barbara from the Art Institute of Chicago. Prior to that, he was with the Allen Memorial Art Museum at Oberlin College, the Frick Collection in New York, and the National Gallery of Art in Washington, D.C. Outstanding credentials. In Chicago, he was the chairman of the Board of Art Resources in Teaching, a nonprofit visual arts literacy organization that worked in partnership with the public elementary schools. And Larry and I have talked about our future partnership and the uh, potential of working with our schools even to a greater extent. You know, it, the art museum has been a, a tremendous resource to us. We often have students at the museum, but we think we can do more. Larry, would you like to take over the mic for a moment? Sure. Well, I, I'm very pleased to be invited here tonight, and I look forward to, I hope to be invited back several, many more times, uh, uh, as uh, I feel quite privileged to be part of this community now, my wife and I. And uh, I do hope to not only continue the partnership that Santa, Santa Barbara Museum of Art has had with the schools here. Um, in fact, that's to a large degree what brought me here is the long-standing commitment to visual arts education of the museum. But I hope what we're going to do over the next several years, as uh, Dr. Sarvis knows, is uh, really scale up what we're doing with the schools. Uh, it is part, part of our mission of our museum is visual arts education. Uh, as Dr. Sarvis mentioned, in Chicago, I was part of another organization in addition to the Art Institute called Art Resources and Teaching. And what we did there was uh, trained and paid professional artists to go into the Chicago public schools, into the inner city public schools, teach art and art history, not because we're trying to create a, a generation of little artists, although that would have been wonderful, but because we believe of the power of visual arts education to build creative thinking skills, to help in problem solving skills, and in the testing that we administered ourselves as well as many other studies, uh, contrary to the one that was mentioned in the New York Times Magazine this weekend, recently conducted by Harvard, what we found when you have visual arts education in the schools, uh, it builds those skills, it helps with the reading scores. It helps with the math. Uh, it also helps these children build confidence in themselves and to understand and appreciate cultures of other people. And so this is very important to us. Art resources, art resources in teaching in Chicago, when I left, I had been chairman of the board for a while. We were serving 40,000 children in the public schools. And that's not one shot. Um, uh, large auditorium lectures, those were six to eight session courses. So really, uh, I think profound uh, education was going on. What we hoped, what we did there and what we hope to do more of here is not only um, in partnership with the public schools, send people in the public schools to help to teach as needed, as uh, appropriate, uh, but also to offer training um, as needed, as requested, uh, to the public school teachers. And additionally, we're hoping to uh, sort of rev up our website a bit. So you'll find before too long on our website uh, guided instruction for teachers and for the students um, so they can access our site and reinforce what they learned in the classroom or go off on their own. Uh, so anyway, uh, we are looking forward to, uh, to a great partnership with you all, and uh, we will we'll be in, in constant contact, I hope. Thanks very much. Wonderful. Wonderful. Thank you, and, I, and we do look forward to seeing you again here. Good. Shall I go on with the superintendent's report? Yes. Well, tonight is Nancy Harder's birthday. Oh. Happy birthday, Ms. Harder. <laughs> Thank you. 
We yeah, had a, I'll, yes, I'll let go people ahead. solve the riddle. My birthday is the speed limit when Gerald Ford was president. <laughs> oh, that's good. Very good. Got it. <laughs> we had a great ribbon cutting at Harding School Friday. And that followed a great Arbor Day celebration at Adams School that morning. Uh, I do particularly want to comment on the ribbon cutting. Harding School is starting a zero waste kitchen. And that means that everything that's used to feed children, not just the leftover pizza crusts, uh, homemade whole foods, organic pizza crusts, low cheese, uh, can be recycled and composted. And that includes the organic plates. I took a bite out of those organic plates. <laughs> They're not tasty, but they are organic. The organic sporks, they all get ground together with the food into compost and turned into soil. And it's a tremendous program. We'd like to get it going across the district. And we think with our new nutrition director, Nancy Weiss, we can probably pull something like that off. We also celebrated the completion of six elevators at Santa Barbara High School. We did that on Monday. Uh, there wasn't much of a showing. You know, uh, it, it's not very spectacular to, <laughs> to open elevators and show off elevators. Uh, but I think it's a very important event and a very symbolic event. Like other bond projects, funding for the elevators was provided by the people of this community. The expense of six elevators, $5.3 million, is also symbolic of the significant amount of bond funds used to provide Americans with Disabilities Act handicap accessibility at schools across Santa Barbara school districts. We're proud to have school facilities that are accessible to students, to parents, to members of the public, to staff, and simply providing curbs, ramps, and restrooms that are all accessible to all does not seem like it would cost that much. In fact, initially, as we started these bond projects, we estimated that the ADA accessibility requirements would cost some $8 million. Well, now that we've paid for almost all of them, the tag has come to close to $30 million. Uh, and that's $30 million across both the, both the elementary district, the Measure I-98 bond, and the secondary district, the Measure V bond. And it's an example of what's happened to many of our bond construction projects in other ways. At the time the district anticipated refurbishing and modernizing bond funding, in 1998 in the elementary district and 2000 in the secondary district, a number of ADA upgrades were already known. They were spread across buildings and sports facilities throughout the districts. What was not known at the time was that the state would be increasing their requirements over the next 10 years and would add to the anticipated ADA upgrades. Well, following a series of lawsuits against school districts across the state, we were one of them, the Division of State Architect moved proactively by increasing the requirements on ADA compliance on renovation projects. Instead of requiring that up to 20% of a school project budget be allocated to ADA, the DSA, D Division of uh, State Architect, required districts to allocate whatever dollar amount was needed to complete the ADA portion of the project. And the resulting impact on project budgets has been significant, not only in our district, but in other districts across the state. Again, I need to say that we're proud to have those facilities uh, that are accessible to all. But there was another factor uh, that added to this. The rising construction costs decreased the value of money from 1998 and from the year 2000 so that that bond money by the time of construction would buy only about half of what it was initially expected to buy. Well, as a result of these factors, over four years ago, the district scaled back bond construction projects to those that would obtain the necessary ADA access, and as a result, uh, other projects were not completed. 
And there were many schools affected by this. Adams School was one of them. Uh, it wasn't just the library at Adams School. It was the portables and some other modernization projects. Cleveland School was one. Franklin, even though we built a brand new wing at Franklin, there were other projects that were not done at Franklin School. Peabody School has uncom uncompleted projects. Washington School, including their library. La Colina Junior High, La Cumbra Junior High, um, Goleta Valley Junior High, Santa Barbara Junior High, Dos Pueblos High School, San Marcos High School, and Santa Barbara High all have projects that were not completed because there was not enough funding through our bond funding. Although it was not my decision at the time to scale back the projects because I was not superintendent, uh, it was the right decision. Elevators may not appear to be exciting, however, to hear from students who today can get to class on time at Santa Barbara High School, a school built in 1924 on a hill, uh, it's a wonderful thing. And the community deserves our heartfelt thanks for making this a reality. Well, that's a little more than I usually say about, uh, about projects, but uh, I know we had uh, some some good press coverage there, and Colby was represented with his paper, for example. Um, but I don't think the community is aware of all of that. Today, I attended the California Association of School Business Officials, CASBO, for the induction of the organization's new president, Eric Smith. Eric Smith is our deputy superintendent, and he is not with us tonight. He's meeting with them for one more day, and he'll be back the following day. CASBO is a private, nonprofit, statewide professional organization that provides its individual school district and county office members with expert professional development, advocacy, and information in the area of school business management and operations. So congratulations to Eric. Last week, La Cuesta Principal Kathy Abney was named Administrator of the Year for District 6 at the California Continuing Education Association. District 6 includes San Luis, Santa Barbara, and Ventura counties. And our secondary district's graduation promotion schedule Let's see, do you have it with you to, well, no. It's posted on the web, and it's accessible on our district homepage, so you can see all the, the times and dates of, of the um, graduation schedule. Coming up is Employee Appreciation Day. That's next week, May 8, at Borders on State Street. The, grou the group Fly to Blue will perform. You will recognize one of its members, Dr. David Gilbertson from our Special Education Department. Sadly, we note the passing of two exceptional education, educational leaders. Longtime administrator John Baitner died on Friday. In his youth, John attended Harding, La Cumbre, Santa Barbara High School, and after serving in the Navy during World War II, he taught at La Colina and went on to serve as the principal of San Marcos High School and a number of other schools, Wilson, Lincoln, and Franklin Elementary Schools. His heart was with the district, and he spent many of his post-retirement years as a consultant here in district office. Over the weekend, longtime Franklin teacher Janice Uloa Brown passed away. Janice, a bilingual educator, joined the elementary district in 1991 and taught at McKinley Cleveland Cesar Chavez Center Charter School, excuse me, and Franklin. And if you attended the district's 140th anniversary just two years ago, 140 years, that's that's right, you will remember the incredible Mexican folk dances performed by her Franklin students. Her students captivated the audience with their spirited performances and reflected Janice's passion for teaching and love of the students she served. Both John and Janice will be missed. Coming up in the days ahead, well, we're wrapping up the year and the performances are just stacking up. Santa Barbara High School, they're 
Visual Arts and Design Academy has its annual art exhibition, which closes this Friday. San Marcos High's uh, performance of Damn Yankees runs May 1 through 3 and 8 through 10. Santa Barbara High's performance of Beauty and the Beast will be on May 9, 10, 11. You'll have to go to the district website to check these dates. It goes through the 17th and there will be a Mother's Day matinee on May 11. Good for them. La Cumbre Junior High will present Gary Smith and the Kids Sing the Hits on May 10. La Colina Junior High's Advanced Concert Band, Jazz Band, and Drumline Spring Concert takes place on May 15. <coughs> Goleta Valley Junior High's Beginning and Advanced co uh, Band Concert will be held on May 20. San Marcos High's Beginning and Advanced Band Concert will take place also on May 20. Dos Pueblos High School will present Beauty and the Beast May 22 through 24. And La Cumbra Junior High will perform Hello Dolly June 4, 6, and 7. And you can go to the district website. It's shown on the board, top of the board, uh, sbsdk12.org for more information or call the school. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> Whew. That was long. That was good. Um, thank you. Dr. Sharvis, these... Um Forms are available on the in the back, yes, correct? They are. So, for any of the public who is interested in having a list of those dates and uh, events that Dr. Sarvis just read, this flyer is available on the back table with all the dates and times listed. Okay, thank you. Uh, now it's time for public comment. This is comment on items that are not on the agenda. You have three minutes. So who do we have tonight? Uh, we have Bart Miller. And Mr. Miller, you think you're going to run a little over the three minutes? Maybe not. OK. Um, I'd like to thank the board for giving me uh, some of their valuable time, even though what I'm going to say is primarily for, for these people here. Um, I'm looking for a little help to help with some fundraising. Uh, the irony probably hasn't escaped most of the people here that at the same time the federal government is giving us fund money, uh, the school board's budget is being slashed, slashed uh, a lot, mercilessly. Anyway, um, so uh, I have a list here that my daughter Leah has uh, to get a few names and some contact numbers uh, for people who would like to help turn that into cash for the district. What that means is that we have to uh, get a hold of people who are open to the idea that the money coming from the federal government probably should have been in education anyway and are willing to take that money, uh, write a check and turn it around and put it back into the school district. And who would be willing to go to Sacramento in June with that check in hand and shake it at those legislatures, le legislators who are not giving us the proper support. I guess that's kind of about it. So um, we've got some information on the back table. There's a form back there. If you don't want to put your name on this list, you can take the form, fill it out, and send a check in. You can make a million copies of it and give it to everybody you know, and they can send money into the district. Um, or you can put your name on our list, and we'll see if we can work together. Uh, one thing, a lot of people have mentioned to me about this idea, that it's going to be very difficult to get money from people when we're asking for it for the district, for the public good and not for their particular child or their particular school. I really don't have a lot to say to that except for that is, has something to do with the problem that Sacramento has right now getting the money to us. That is that we're all kind of not working together, every man for himself. So if you're willing to work together, uh, please step to the back and give me your name. That's okay. it. Thank Are there you. any questions? Um, the, for the TV audience, the, the cable audience, when, when it replays, um, is there some way to contact you? I, I can give them my email address. Yeah, it's well, probably a good know. idea. T e TV email? Um, <laughs> I will give, here's an email address for those on TV. Front desk, that's F-R-O-N-T-D-E-S-K, at ma-construction.com. Thank you. All right, thank you. Okay, 
Uh, the consent agenda. Does anyone want to make a motion? I want to pull some items. Okay, go for it. Uh, I'd like to pull uh, D4. Well, I had a comma there, but actually oh, it's a period. D4. Oh, okay, anything else? Anybody else? Otherwise, move, move to, to oh, right. Move to approve, with the exception of D4. Second. Cordero and Harder. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Uh, passes 5-0. Uh, the action agenda, do we want to go out of order now or just keep going? Uh, E1, which is uh, about Peabody. Good. Well, we have a request from Peabody School and the foundation to name the Peabody Exploration Center the Pinner Family Exploration Center. Kate Ford, would you like to... Certainly. Uh, as you know, Peabody School has continued its fundraising and has now fulfilled its obligation to the district uh, to essentially pay back the loan for the additional funding it took beyond what was initially anticipated simply to be a big box library at that school. Uh, that big box library turned into something much, much more. It turned into an exploration center with a science lab, uh, with a technology lab, and it is a beautiful facility. Kate? Thank you, Dr. Sarvis, and uh, thank you, board members, and Dr. Melikoff especially. I'm really happy to be here, and on behalf of the Peabody Board of Directors and the entire staff and Peabody community, we are so delighted that we have had a family come forward and make the offer to uh, make a donation of $300,000 that will help offset paying off the debt, as you know, for the Exploration Center. And uh, it is a most wonderful learning environment. I, I don't think any of us can imagine anything more beautiful. Uh, the, the family has given us a written commitment, and it has been um, verified by legal counsel. And we are so happy because Trey Pinner, many of you know Trey, was a founding member of our foundation council at Peabody, and his wife, Nancy Pinner, is also a, uh, a teacher. She is our ceramics teacher and considered to be the art mentor at Peabody. In addition to Trey and Nancy, his sisters, his two sisters, are also part of the donation. And on April 14th, as I indicated in the letter to Dr. Sarvis, we held a ceremony of gratitude, which was a beautiful time for the entire school to show its gratitude and for formal organizations within the school to also have representatives to share their gratitude. I do want to publicly apologize to you for not inviting you to the event. It was just an oversight of a very busy time, but I do would really want you to come forward and I would love to bring uh, Trey and Nancy to a board meeting if you'd like to meet them and um, hope that uh, although um, it's a little different kind of a donation than you may be used to for a naming um, grant or permission, uh, I hope you will allow us to name it the, P the Pinner Family Exploration Center. Go ahead. I had a question. Um, I I know that the, or I, at least I believe that the just that we have a policy about naming uh, buildings, etc., facilities. And can, can you just refresh my memory what the policy is? Uh, it's I, it's I, right back here. I didn't. Yes. Oh, the one we have in our. At it's the in the back. binders, essentially yeah, the about back. a significant contribution, and uh, that si significant <laughs> contribution is sometimes monetary. Page 35 is the new one, and um, the see. former policy, you just have to dig through the, the 
crossed out sheets. It's about 10 pages in. It's not different, is it? Here it is. It's a little bit uh, different. It's board policy 7310. The governing board shall name schools or individual buildings in recognition of, and there are three things noted, individuals, living or deceased, who have made an outstanding, who have made outstanding contributions to the county or community. Secondly, individuals, living or deceased, who have made contributions of state, national, or worldwide significance. And third, the geographic area in which the school or building is located. I really knew it. <laughs> so this seems to fall within our guidelines. Well, we haven't adopted that policy yet, but uh, we, a little later tonight. Well, I was, I was reading from the old one. That's, <coughs> that's from the old one, too. Oh, I got the AR. There we go. Yeah. Uh, hashing over this isn't going to change anything. I'd actually like to make well, a motion I moved to, to accept uh, the Pinner family's uh, donation, and I would very much like for, for Trey and Nancy to come to a future meeting to Absolutely. have the opportunity for everyone to thank yeah. them. Second. Okay. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? Passes 5 0. So <laughs> thank you so much. And we do have our mariachi band coming in May, so maybe that would be a great time for, great for the pinners to also come. Thank you again. Thank, thank you. you. Say thank you to them for us. Uh, E2, the second reading of the proposed Santa Barbara School District's discipline guidelines and dress code. I apologize. There was a public speaker on E1, and I oh. forgot oh gosh. to call that one. Mr. Wheeler, would you like to speak on E1 at this point? Sorry. <laughs> Thank you. I thought that might be Providence acting, but uh, since you have offered me the opportunity, I will take the ad advantage of it. Uh, I think this is a great opportunity for the uh, district to uh, once again have a partnership with a community entity. Uh, one of the questions I would raise is in a time when our district has been uh, restricted by cutting $4 million out of the budget, the uh, only uh, concern I had is that this is being paid over a series of years at $50,000 a year rather than a one-time lump sum payment that would then allow our district to have some opportunity to possibly not cut programs or ask schools to uh, modify contract or um, create a continued hardship. We've had this outstanding debt. We've asked for it to be paid back, and it hasn't come forth in a timely manner. And it, it seems like while this is addressing that to some degree, uh, the cuts that you were caused to make last week had to be done before Wednesday morning. And it seems like the same due diligence m should be applied to this. Uh, and if there's any coercion that the district can do to cause this payment to come at a, a more uh, expedient pace, I would encourage the district to do that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Now, I don't know if you want to comment on facilities money. Yeah, the, these are these were bond funds. Uh, they were they were not the funds uh, that the district made four million dollars in cuts in just this last meeting. They were bond funds. However, uh, I think the point is a good one that we did have bond projects that were waiting. And without that money being repaid, we may have had to hold some of those uh, projects. And uh, well, our past experience has been that the longer we hold projects, the more expensive they get. OK. Now we'll go on to E2, since we already took the vote. Um, the second reading of the proposed Santa Barbara School District's discipline guidelines and dress code. I'll look oh. off, uh, go, Superintendent. Go right ahead. You've, he you've heard this policy before. It's been presented to you before, and we're bringing it back for your action tonight. Uh, Michael Gonzalez is our Director of Compliance and Categorical Programs. Michael, thank, thank you. Thank you. You may recall that we uh, produced, uh, we presented to the board these documents on February 12th. There was a number of recommendations that were made by the board that have been incorporated in the revisions that you have before you. 
I will share with you that um, their uh, staff is recommending that uh, the board approve the recommendations as stated. I will also share with you that I very much need to thank the assistant principals that worked on this project. Uh, it is important for a school to have uniform standards regarding dress codes and uh, discipline consequences across all secondary schools and all uh, elementary schools. I wanted to share with you uh, that uh, there has been much discussion regarding um, the consequences for uh, what I will label as uh, violation of education code number seven listed on, uh, on the uh, attachments before you. I will share with you that very clearly staff is recommending that we get involved with what I will label as a three strikes approach to possession, use, or under the influence of substance abuse uh, or drugs uh, or intoxicants. Uh, and you will find that working in partnership with, the, uh, with Ed Quay of the Santa Barbara Teen Court Organization, we have come up with what I believe are very appropriate uh, consequences for students who get caught up with uh, substance abuse violations. In the same breath, I also want to share with you that we did meet with uh, the uh, re school resource officers, both the Santa Barbara Police Department as well as the sheriffs. We met with representatives of probation and I've had an opportunity to speak to just about every assistant principal. I want to share with you and go on record that they do not support the district moving into a three strikes approach. They very clearly believe that it is in our best interest for student safety to uh, continue with the present policy that calls for two strikes. Uh, as the uh, person responsible in the district for overseeing the expulsion services over the last four years, I believe we have presented uh, evidence to the board that in many cases that might not be an appropriate recommendation. Attached to E2 uh, are a series of statements that were submitted to us in support of the three strikes approach. They come from the Santa Barbara Teen Legal Clinic, they, who I believe is here tonight. They come from the, uh, the CADA Fighting Back Organization, Daniel Bryan Teen Court that is represented here tonight. Dr. Sh Jill Sharkey also submitted to us a document. I do not believe that Dr. Sharkey is here tonight, but her statement is attached to that. And uh, there may be one other document whose name I forget. Uh, I think I'll leave it at that. Um, I, I simply want to remind the board that one of the revisions that you asked us to make was to make sure that board policy uh, were cited in uh, the drafts, and uh, I, I hope that those inclusions meet with your approval. Mr. Gonzalez, I know there's also quite a bit of interest about the dress code changes, and the primary change, to my mind, is one of, of specificity rather than a rather vague uh, dress code policy uh, that, that uh, alludes to, to gang uh, dress or gang paraphernalia. Could you comment on the dress code changes as well? That is correct. Uh, you may recall uh, back in February when we approached the board, um, as several board members said, look, uh, written policies are one thing, enforcement is another, and, and we grant you that. That is very, very clearly uh, the challenge with any kind of regulation that involves students, uh, secondary students. I will share with you, however, is that the assistant principals who worked on this design uh, have the responsibility day, day in and day out of making sure that our campuses continue to be the safe learning environments they are. There is a number of clothing issues related to our students. Gang clothing, uh, is certainly one of the current issues, but by no means is it the only one. Uh, all of, most of the board members have commented 
in the past about their visits to our high schools in particular and uh, some of the dress that was allowed that is probably inappropriate. This dress code is designed to send a very clear message to administrators, to staff, to students, and parents that this kind of clothing should not be permitted uh, at our schools. Again, I grant you that the enforcement issue will be the next big hurdle in enforcement of any of these rules, but especially the dress code. There's some other changes here. I noted something about the cell phones and that's bad. Uh, correct. You, you may recall that uh, board members had reservations about banning cell phones and the committee did relook at that issue and it's very clear that um, we should not ban cell phones entirely from the, uh, from the school sites. However, we continue to maintain that under no circumstances can cell phone usage interfere with instruction at our schools. Go ahead. I'm a little confused. Uh, I count uh, a number of, of items, uh, such things as hate crime or violence, terroristic threats, uh, harassment <coughs> threats, intimidation, inclu including uh, against witnesses, uh, use of physical force uh, upon another person, which I, I, maybe I just don't know how to read your table, uh, but in the last two or three of those, uh, it tolerates a first, a second, and, a th and additional offenses, which seems to me terribly permissive. Uh, and, th and then there's an operative verb uh, at the very beginning. A student may be s suspended. I don't see any shelbies. Uh, it looks to me like this is a very open-ended, uh, as I say, permissive uh, set of recommendations. A possession of a knife or dangerous object, uh, five days suspension, and possible recommendation for expulsion uh, on the first offense. And then there's a possible second offense, five days suspension and recommendation for expulsion. As far as I'm concerned, possession of a knife on campus is grounds for expulsion on one offense. And I think that uh, an awful lot of people in this community would share that sentiment. If I may comment, um, the, uh, the Ed Code is very clear with expulsions with possession of knives. We usually do not include the language that I'm going to share with you now. The Ed Code, for example, when it speaks to the issue of possession or knife, also has a clause that uh, again is not ordinarily associated with this writing that one, uh, a possession of a knife with the permission of a certificated staff member is allowable. But two, uh, the Ed Code also talks about uh, school officials having the obligation to take a look at was there any extenuating circumstances that lead a student uh, to possession of that knife. You have charged uh, the principals and the assistant principals as well as the administrative hearing panel should it get to that level to make that judgment and make a recommendation to you folks regarding an expulsion recommendation. And up till now, I believe that that uh, process has worked very well to protect our students and our staff. Now, what about a hate crime or violence then? What's, what, what's the Ed Code say about that? because here we have up to five days suspension, uh, a parent conference, referral to a counselor or teen court for the first offense, uh, five days suspension, parent and law enforcement notification recommendation for expulsion for the second offense, a hate crime or violence. Well, you left out part of that. The what, first what? offense also includes possible recommendation for expulsion. With possible recommendation for expulsion. Uh, possible. It's been uh, my. I, I mean, that just seems, as I say, terribly permissive for a, a hate crime or. Maybe how does the law define hate crime or, 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 or violence? Maybe it's. Maybe I'm just using this. That Mr. Price just left, but uh, he pointed out to me once that common sense doesn't necessarily rule when you read the law. If if I may share with you, uh, my experiences as. Uh, an administrator of a junior high is that often 
junior high students will make statements that are hateful in nature but do not rise to a uh, consequence that includes expulsion. These policies are written in such a way that it does give school administrators the kind of leeway and freedom they need to make a good judgment before uh, an expulsion recommendation is made. Okay, you, use of physical force upon another person. Let's, so let's try that one because that has first, second, and potentially additional offenses uh, and nothing, and, and no shalls. Use of physical force upon another person. Right. Uh, again, I will share with you that uh, it's been my experience, again, reflecting on junior high as well as high school experiences, that uh, force upon a student uh, at a junior high, for example, could include and be interpreted as a student who grabs another student by the arm or by the shoulder in a hallway that would not rise to a recommendation to expel. On the other hand, a, uh, an assault, uh, a very clear assault, uh, does rise the first time to an expulsion recommendation. And again, what we've given is guidelines to our administrators to interpret each and every individual case that's brought before them and judge those cases on the merits of that individual case. And that's what these guidelines are designed to do. They're also designed to make sure that uh, parents and students understand that there are certain kinds of behaviors that are going to uh, have consequences. But the primary, uh, this is a tool for administrators to use to make sure that their schools continue to be safe and are open to interpretation. Well, let me move on to that point then because I have heard from a number of uh, constituents that some administrators are pussycats when it comes to enforcing these rules, and that, they, that they're extremely permissive, uh, that it's like an open door, a revolving door. And uh, uh, how, so how do we, as, as the board, as elected uh, member, members of the board, how do we get accountability of some kind, some assurance, that all the, all the things, that this discretion that you're saying is built into these things does not, is not discretion to the extreme of permissiveness rather than some kind of discretion uh, to really hold kids accountable for the rules. You know, and, 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 and not be afraid to administer consequences for, for non-compliance with the rules. This, this seems very open-ended in the hands of administrators, some of whom have the reputation of being very, very soft. I, I think I'll, I'll state my own position and then defer to the uh, superintendent and assistant superintendents. It is, I believe, the function of the board to direct the superintendent and the assistant superintendents who direct the directors who work with the principals on enforcement of rules. And if you have these kind of concerns, those concerns need to be, I believe, expressed to the superintendent and the assistant superintendents to take the appropriate actions. That is my own belief, and I'll defer to our administrators. And uh, Mr. Gonzalez is right that, uh, first of all, there are variances in any particular uh, one of these codes, your last one, use of physical force. There, there are unfortunate interpretations that also have to be included in any of these, and I speak as an assistant principal and principal as well. If there are individuals who are dissatisfied with the procedures on a campus, they can go to the principal and talk about that. If they're dissatisfied with the result from there, they can lodge a formal complaint with Mr. Gonzalez, with others at this district, and then we investigate all those things. We preempt the complaints by training the assistant principals and the principals consistently and properly, but we don't, we don't, um, overturn the ed code in any particular manner because the ed code is specifically vague enough to realize that no one position or no one circumstance is exactly the same as another. So we, we have processes in place to make sure that, that all of these things happen. And yes, sometimes there are individuals who don't see 
quite the same way that, that you or I or Mr. Gonzalez or maybe some others would in terms of doling out punishments for certain actions. If those rise to the level of our knowledge, we deal with it immediately. I have a couple of questions. Um, one of them had to do with the the issue of um, the the dress code, the dress code rather than the disciplinary code, um, and the language says the policy further prohibits the presence of any special any apparel that, including on, on I'm sorry, including hats, jewelry, accessories, notebooks, and this is the part that concerns me or manner of grooming including haircuts which by virtue of its color arrangement trademark or any other attribute denotes membership in a gang and I'm Im imagining I mean I could imagine I guess people getting their gang affiliation sort of uh, cut into their hair or the way people have um, hairs des hair designs that would be a clear violation of this policy. They would have a clear gang affiliation. But other than than that extreme, I'm wondering how hair style or hair and haircuts would be identified as gang affiliation. I'm wondering, for example, would shave would a person having a shaved head be identified as gang a gang haircut? I do not believe that our school administrators would simply judge short hair uh, as a violation of the dress code. I, I always remind people uh, as we're speaking about dress codes that almost any athlete you're going to find has short hair. What administrators are looking for is a combination of things, a behavior in the classroom in the schoolyard, in hallways, along with clothing, along with graffiti, along with uh, uh, the clothing currently associated with gangs, along with hair, all adds up to something. These policies are designed to give school administrators the opportunity to sit down with the students and say how you're dressed at this time under these circumstances is inappropriate and to send the same message to parents. It is often a judgment call. Uh, it's been my experience that by and large, though Dr. Noel has said that there has been some cases of abuse in the past, it has been my experience that generally our administrators are very upright and do a fantastic job of securing uh, safety at our schools and any tools that we can provide our administrators that helps them do that job I'm going to support in addition I want to share with you that as the assistant principals were working on this dress code they had an opportunity to speak to school resource officers who brought to the table the kind of information that uh, they are hoping to prevent that is happening in other neighborhoods. And so some of this is preemptive. And uh, I'll leave it at that. Well, your, your answer actually leads to an, another concern because I'm, I'm typically not in favor of policies that are selectively enforced. Um, and and so correct me if I'm wrong, but what I was interpreting from your, from your response is that if a student is dressed in a particular way, um, has maybe in, uh, exhibited some other characteristics, that that student's haircut, for example, might be interpreted one way. If the student had the exact same haircut but hadn't exhibited these other uh, characteristics that their the haircut would possibly be interpreted a different way and my experience is that students really respond negatively to rules that they s that they perceive as being directed at something other than the the specific uh, fact 
So if one student could wear a hairstyle and have it not be considered um, a violation, but another student could wear the same hairstyle and because of other characteristics that they possess, have it be deemed a violation, I would find that a bit troubling and I, I can only imagine that students would have a very difficult time accepting that kind of a policy. I will share with you two responses. First of all, we're required by the education code to treat every individual as an individual and look at the individual circumstances and facts surrounding whatever the issue is. But second of all, what, what you're really uh, uh, reinforcing is that these documents once they're approved, the real task will be for our system principals and principals to explain these documents properly to students and to parents as part of the orientation process. And uh, I believe that uh, historically our school administrators have been very successful in making sure that students and parents do understand why these kinds of policies exist and uh, treat students by and large in a very fair manner. May well I then let me, I'm sorry, then let me just make one more direct request and that is um, could we have a, maybe a definition or a description of what would be considered a haircut that might violate this or what would be the parameters for the, for, because if I were a principal and I had to enforce this policy, I'm not sure, I mean, I'm granted, the principals who've had a lot of experience would probably be in a much better position to, to make that judgment, but I'm not sure that everyone would be in agreement, that all of the principals at the different sites would be in agreement as to what kind of haircuts would violate this policy and what kind of haircuts would be within the, the range of acceptable. I can, I can actually give you firsthand two examples. And they're, they're very explicit and I think we can probably wander down the, the road of haircuts and then a variety of other fashion items that may or may, be, may or not be questionable. Um, the first one involves keeping, you know, I've got short hair too and that's okay. The point is that there are examples of individuals who would shave the letters, three letters that denote affiliation with a particular gang into your hair. That's unacceptable. It's the same as wearing a t-shirt. By the opposite token, I have first-hand experience with somebody who has a shaved head and allowed the hair to grow only in the shape of three letters that denoted, et cetera. The only time that I've ever asked somebody to grow their hair out, uh, an individual whose head was shaved, was because the letters E, S, K were tattooed on the back of the individual's head. You can't have somebody walking around with a bandage pasted on the back of their head because it actually draws more attention to the issue than not. And so there are extreme cases, but extreme cases mean incredibly few cases. And I, and I think that that's where, again, we, the vagueness of it allows administrators who are properly trained and understand what the situations are to deal with the individual situations as that, as individual situations. Well, I totally agree with your examples. I think those are exactly what I was saying. Those are the extreme cases where it would be very clear that that violates the, the, gang, the gang affiliation um, prohibition. I'm, if, if I guess my uh, concern is that for me, that seems like almost the only clear cut mm -hmm. example of where it would be clear. These students are clearly denoting gang affiliation with their hairstyle. I'm wondering if, if that is the only clear cut example or a clear cut instance, then maybe we could specifically state that rather than leaving it so vague. I, so I totally I understand. Let me just make an observation because Mrs. Uh, Cordero has a very good point. Uh, but perhaps it comes under insignia. If that's, if that's the only case we're talking about, maybe, maybe her point is leave hair alone and talk about insignia. I understand. My only response would be, uh, and, it's, and it's exactly the same as a dress code. A dress code can, it deals with what we know now. Individuals dress in a certain way now. What we can't do is tell the future. We can't tell if a certain hairstyle, and I, I, I don't know if I've ever spent this long talking about hair, but a certain hairstyle may certainly denote 
affiliation with a gang sometime in the future that we don't know about. You know, the uh, Oakland Raiders or the Los Angeles Raiders, whenever they happen to be in whichever particular city, I'm sure didn't ever think that uh, a massive gang would co-opt their insignia to the point where they weren't going to be allowed in most of the, the districts in California. And so I would say that erring on the side of caution is is appropriate. I know what you're saying and I understand what you're saying. I think that um, when you weigh the, the cost benefit, who would be harmed by this and do I personally and does Mr. Gonzalez uh, believe in the ability of the administrators not to abuse this particular language? I believe in the, in the abilities of those administrators and I believe that Mr. Gonzalez does as well. So I think what you're doing is simply putting something in place to potentially deal with an evolution of hairstyle or fashion that we haven't come yet to understand. Ms. Harder. My only response. I, I just, I have a question, um, and that is, we are not talking about a haircut in and of itself, being able to uh, uh, be the entire dress code violation. We're talking about haircut in combination with other factors. So can we clarify the language that would say apparel, and then it goes on to name these other things, to, to specify some combination of these things so that it's not just a haircut or it's not just a hat or it's not just a, a t-shirt, that it would be some combination of factors. I don't know if that helps. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think it could just be one. I mean, you could have somebody who's dressed fine and has the initials, some uh, offensive initials in their hair and that's a violation of dress code and um, so I, I think it could just be one item so I don't know if it helps to do it any uh, to talk about a combination of things uh, I do want to talk about the discipline policy but since we're on dress code I'd like to jump in here because I have issues with um, number three and number four on the following will not be permitted um, plain white t-shirts when worn in combination with another black or blue t-shirt um, just because I've seen so many students on our secondary campuses wearing layered t-shirts and I don't know I mean this would speak to enforcement for me um, and again that really would be picking and choosing who are you um, who are you calling into the office because of this and who are you not calling in and then also with the baggy pants um, I see lots of kids with baggy pants and I'm wondering if the issue is really saggy pants or if it's visible underwear um, and in w because it's hard to define when is this a problem when is this a fashion statement but um, I think that underwear would be obvious um, so I don't know if you have any comments on those two I, I do I, I shared with you that much of the stress code uh, the basis for the language was uh, meetings that our school resource officers have attended over the past several years. We've not had the experience here in Santa Barbara and, and I, I hope that we continue to be as fortunate as we have been. School resource officers will share with you that baggy pants, baggy sweatshirts do represent an opportunity for the concealment of weapons. I take a very conservative approach when it comes to student safety. Uh, I do not want to report to you that a weapon was hidden in baggy pants. I, I sometimes find my own son with, with baggy pants and wearing, showing his shorts. That's really not my concern. My concern is for the safety of students and staff the baggy pants has to do with concealment of weapons, and that's where we stand. Can I just piggyback on that? And I think this is, I don't know if this is uh, Ms. Parker's concern or not, but this is where I keep running into concerns, and that is, I share your concern. I don't, I, if, if clothing is allowing students to conceal weapons, and we have evidence that preventing that style of clothing would prevent any weapons from being concealed, then I think we should definitely uh, restrict the clothing. My concern is as I listen to 
some of the responses. I'm, I, I, I feel like I'm continuing to hear that there will be some discretion in how this is imposed. And that is where I, 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 I do respect the integrity and the, the professionality of the administrators that we have on campus. But I also think that we, we tread a very um, fine line when we are talking about how we're going to enforce a policy. So if the policy is going to be that no student on campus can wear baggy pants and we have a clear definition of what constitutes baggy, then I'm, I'm willing to consider that. But if I'm being told that certain students on campus are gonna, the, the administrators are gonna look the other way if their clothes are baggy, and other students who have more characteristics are gonna get called into the office and sent home and written up and et cetera, if their clothes are baggy, then that's where I have the problem. So, and I feel the same way about sweatshirts, et cetera. If the, if the policy is going to be applied very uniformly to every student on campus, um, the t-shirts, et cetera, then that's, that's one thing. But if the policy is going to be applied only to students who seem to fit the profile of what, of a gang member, then I really have a problem with that because there are students who, who legitimately choose to dress in a gang influenced style who are not gang members. Um, so either the clothing style is allowable or the clothing style is not allowable, but it needs to be the same for every student on campus. I, I find it difficult uh, to respond properly to the idea that all things are the same. What should the board choose to adopt this policy? It will require sitting down and training with the principals and assistant principals and share the kind of comments and observations you have made. I cannot assure anyone sitting before me that there will never be a violation of one of these rules, given the circumstances that you outlined. What I will share with you is that generally my experience has been that school administrators are very fair in their treatment of students. I give you that sometimes that has not been the case, but generally you will find administrators in this district are very fair in their judgments that they make. Judgment calls are judgment calls, and it will require conversations and training. And that's my response to your concern. Well, I, I need to go a little further, which is to say that for these 14 items, uh, you're right on target. I mean, they need to be equally applied and objectively applied to all students. So we cannot move forward with these without that understanding. But I think that's generally true, Dr. Sarvis, because yes. I mean, we're really talking about, I don't know whether this is public law, but it's law. And, and fundamental principles of law, uh, due process principles, are that it has to be clear. Yes. And, uh, and I hear an awful lot of fuzziness and ambiguity here, both in the dress code and, the, and in the other uh, sections of this, that, and, and, and it throws so much weight on the, on the judgment of those on the street, and, and I understand that's true in law enforcement in general, uh, but they do an awful lot of training in law enforcement and, I, and what I guess I'm wanting to hear now is what are we doing about training the administrators who are going to be interpreting this? Well, we, we will go into training. Uh, and in fact, and, 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 there ought to be, and there ought to be a lawyer. Uh, oh, I don't want to hire more lawyers. I'll take them back. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Hey, may, may, may I respond to that point? Please know, <laughs> as I shared with you back in February, that these regulations were reviewed by council and were approved. Ms. Parker, you weren't done. Well, I, I do also want to talk on the discipline policy, and I'm sure that you all do as well. Um, going back to the discipline policy, um, a few things that came up for me. One is that I did not see um, cheating and plagiarizing on this list, and I'm not sure. I mean, I know obviously every school has its policies. I haven't seen a board policy on it, um, and I'm not sure if it was just going to be left up to site discretion or if this was something else that should be 
consistent across all schools. If it's not on there, it's our oversight and it should be consistent across all the schools. Okay. Um, so I would like to get the committee recommendation on cheating and plagiarism. We'd be happy to come back with something on that because I don't recall that we have a policy on that either. Okay. And the other thing, uh, another thing that came up for me is that it says at the top um, that, you know, the student may be suspended or expelled for any of the acts listed below if it occurs while on school grounds, while going to or coming from school during the lunch period or during going to or coming from any school sponsored activity at any school. And that brought up um, the issue of social networking sites and the internet for me. Um, when some of these things such as um, uh, hate crimes and harassment, threats of intimidation, et cetera, um, what are the, um, what are the parameters in terms of if this is going on between students on social networking sites like Facebook or MySpace? The, uh, the general guideline under the education code is one, does it interfere with instruction? And two, can uh, a nexus, a connection between school and this activity be established? If it can, the school has jurisdiction. If it cannot, the school does not have jurisdiction. Um, if, I, if I can uh, in, intrude at this point in time, Dr. Noel would remember, other board members would not. We actually had an expulsion related to a social networking website that was deemed um, a hate crime and it was dealt with. So it, 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 anything using the computer with a nexus to the school that could fall under the heading of any of these things mm -hmm. falls under our jurisdiction. Then assuming that this is something that's going to be available for parents, then I, I think, and students obviously, it would be helpful to have that clarified in the top of the discipline guidelines so that they don't have any um, misconceptions about what they're doing in the privacy of their own home um, in terms of how it could affect another student and how it could be related to um, interfering with the student's education. Th that's a very good suggestion. I if I could draw your attention to number 29 of the Discipline Code, which is found, I believe, on page 5. It, you will find that 29 references an acceptable use policy. Uh, that appendice was not attached to uh, your attachments. However, we will make sure that that kind of language is embedded in uh, every school's acceptable use policy. Well, that was going to be my question about number 29. Does that, does number 29 apply only to school computers or does it apply to personal computers as well? Uh, again, as I shared with you, the ed code is very clear. Either that activity is interfered with instruction or a nexus, that's the language that's used, or connection can be established between that activity and school. And, and I think uh, Mrs. Harder mentioned a case uh, where that nexus was proven. We've done some work on updating the acceptable use policy and we need to bring that back to you for, for revision anyway. But I think that the point that Mrs. Mm -hmm. Parker raises is important because while 29 is an offense in and of itself, computers could come into play when you're talking about extortion, terroristic threats, hate crimes, yes. um, uh, you know, that kind of thing, so. Mm -hmm. it, j just to clarify, you're absolutely correct. You may recall, uh, as you've seen from expulsion packets, that schools uh, have been instructed that when they suspend, they're to list all of the possible violations concerning that fact. And so it's possible that a student could make uh, harassment uh, as well as defiance of school rules as well as a number 29. And so schools regularly do that now. But uh, again, I do believe that your point is important enough for clarity that we need to include it in the acceptable use policy. Okay. And I had... Can I just add one more thing to what you said was that beginning part where it's uh, the student may be suspended or expelled. Can you go back to that, the very beginning of this? Page one? On the two? first page, on the second page. Top of the chart. Top, top of the chart. That also we have expelled people, students who are truant, um, and that's not, in, doesn't seem to be included in there. There are students that walk off campus and do something. We have included that. Um, just to clarify for the record, uh, no. Uh, 
is the answer to that. We have never expelled a student simply for being truant. No, no, I didn't mean, I meant they've done one of these things Correct. while they're truant. Excuse but if me. you read the Correct. guidelines oh, up above, yes. it says going it to or from school during lunch or off campus during going to, et cetera, et cetera. But it doesn't really say during school hours but off campus. Doesn't say not going to school. When not you going have. to school. And <laughs> 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 we've certainly seen <laughs> yeah. that many times. That, that's, um, that's a very good clarification. Thank you. Um, uh, yes, I, I had a couple of. Well, well, she was, no, she I, I, I interrupted her. So, <laughs> the one other thing that I wanted to touch on was number seven. Um, the we currently have um, a first offense situation. This is for the possession under the influence and or use of any controlled substance, alcoholic beverage, or intoxicant. Currently, we do first offense, five-day suspension, um, referral to counseling, um, such as a super program, teen court, um, and so forth. And right now, for our second uh, offense, um, it is suspension again and a recommendation for expulsion. And I saw some of the things in the documents, some of the um, documents that referred to a zero tolerance policy um, that made me sort of wonder because there are zero tolerance policies in some districts and states where um, if somebody's put up for expulsion then no matter what the circumstances are they're expelled and that is not what we're talking about in terms of a zero tolerance policy it's it is a recommendation for expulsion so when I look at the data and the last time that you presented um, quite comprehensive data that talked about second drug offenses was um, uh, in the summer of 2006, Mr. Gonzalez, when you did a report on uh, expulsions over three years. So what I saw was that in 0304 there were 28 uh, recommendations <coughs> for expulsion because of second offense. The number expelled was 13. Again in 0405 it was 28. The number expelled was 11. In 0506 it was 19 recommended for expulsion. The number expelled was 12. So the board and the administrative hearing panel have always looked at these circumstances on a case-by-case -case basis and decided <coughs> is this student a danger to himself or to others or would this student be better served um, in an alternative setting. Um, so I'm, I guess I'm wondering what is, what is it that, um, that is the concern for staff and when you say staff you don't mean any of the site administrators. They all think that it's not a good idea to the shift. The vast it. majority, correct. And law enforcement does not think it's a good idea to change it. Correct. Um, so these, we do look at these kids on a case-by-case -case basis. They do get counseling. Um, and I guess I just need some more information on why um, you think that this is a good idea. Sure. In the uh, cover memo, I, I've mentioned to you previously uh, Michael Blatcher's uh, perspective on expulsion to, um, under the influence or possession or use of uh, uh, illegal substances. Michael Blatcher, an attorney who I have great respect to and has been the main consultant to our district over the years regarding discipline and expulsion, uh, has contended for some time that while he does uphold the two strikes, he also believes that there's a problem, he believes, with uh, uh, combining junior high activities with high school activities. He has long contended that uh, while he agrees with two strikes, that he would rather separate uh, violations that happen at the junior high from violations that happen at the high school. H and I believe that his thinking has much to do with a lot of the data that exists uh, regarding brain research and students' understanding of their actions and consequences at this early age. That kind of thinking and those kinds of conversations with Michael began uh, a journey of studying this issue more in depth. I had, uh, I, I recall, uh, I shared with you that one of the things that school districts are obligated to look at, school officials are obligated to look at, have we exhausted all means of correction before we take the final action of removing students from our district? 
I've long felt that um, super, while it's a great program, does not constitute all the means of correction at our disposal. Uh, the, uh, the folks at Daniel Bryant and Teen Court have put together a series of options that I believe uh, will satisfy the definition of have we met uh, all the possible corrections before we take the ultimate action of removing a student from our school district. So my own thinking uh, uh, in recommending uh, a three strikes approach falls on the work of Michael Blatcher, the questions he's raised to me, and the work that I've been able to do with the uh, groups that I've mentioned. Could I just ask you real quick? Um, who would pay for the parent program and the assessment? Currently, all those programs are paid for, and we would continue to recommend that they be paid for by the parent. Those, uh, the teen court and Daniel Bryant, use a sliding schedule uh, pay schedule, to my knowledge, they have never turned away any student who's been referred to those organizations for services. They have found a way to have parents pay even a minimal cost for those services. Okay, go ahead. Uh, I doubt if any students ever read this. Uh, so, what, so, what, so they know this only through its application on a case by case basis. They may, I know it's probably in a student handbook somewhere, but I, I'll stick to my hypothesis that a lot of, that not many students read this. Uh, and, and, and this whole, and that raise, that's the point where I want to go with this. What we're really talking about is a whole system, a gestalt. Uh, and, and yet we tend to, to kind of commit the reductionist fallacy of looking at it in its parts rather than looking at the whole, which is greater than the sum of the parts. And it has to do with the, the I guess you call it the climate of the campus or the culture of the campus and, and the set of expectations that are not written uh, exclusively, but that are part of the everyday life that ever, among all the students and the faculty. And, and, uh, and the, here's where, and, and through the years I have heard both from parents, from students, from teachers, uh, from administrators, that we come up short in the whole package. We come up short in having a coherent, credible package of, of policies on discipline, or pardon me, implementation of policies on discipline on our campuses. So, so that's why I, where I, when I was mentioning, uh, I just think that it's terribly important that, uh, that we look at this in an operational way, uh, particularly with some, some training and, I, and, not, and a pretty rigorous training. And, and I'm just wondering if it might not make a lot of sense since we're this, the whole premise of this is that we want policies that are uniform across the district. I, that, that we establish a district-wide uh, group that, uh, that, will, that will oversee uh, the, the stand, oversee the policies, the application of the policies, and try to maintain standards and applications. And when I think of that, I'm not talking about getting a bunch of new people. I'm thinking of a, a, a district-wide body of these administrators so that there can be coordination uh, to, uh, among them. So it's consistent across the district. Thank you, Madam President. I, 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 have, I have opinions, ideas, I, but I would I actually like to hear public comment. I don't know. Ms. Cordero, did you want to say something? Well, I had just one. I had, I'm sorry, I had one additional concern that I would like to sh ask a question about. And maybe, I, I don't know if members of the uh, public are going to comment on this or not, and that is the change in the um, use of cell phones. And I'm specifically looking at the note on page five um, below the chart that I says um, no electronic devices with the exception of calculators and cell phones are allowed on campus. Cell phones must be turned off from the start of school 
until students are dismissed. And I was wondering if that meant, if that would include lunch period or if they're considered dismissed for lunch and then it would resume after lunch. It is not a staff recommendation that we ban phones during lunchtime unless they constitute an issue that needs to be controlled. But at this time, we are not advocating that they be banned during lunch. Then could that be more specific then? I think that's, I certainly got a call from my son during lunch today. So we can change that nice. language. <laughs> Anyone else? Uh, can I ask one more question before we go to public comment? Uh, number seven, um, might there be a time, or, or even any of these, I suppose, where one offense constitutes an expulsion, uh, where it's so so blatant, uh, whatever that you might that administrators might consider that worth an expulsion? Of any particular violation in general, or or. Because is that the answer possible? is yes. So the, it is possible within this. And so we could still. You're referring only to number seven, right? But it's true with any of them. Almost. Okay. Is That's that correct. That is true. So it's the level of seriousness. So in, in practice, even with this change, we could still be seeing after second offenses, seeing people go up to, for the drug and alcohol, go, come up for expulsion. Correct. These are guidelines. Okay, okay. All right, let's go to, if everyone's okay, let's go to some. All right, we have several um, speakers, and so I'm going to call your name and then the two following speakers as well, just so that you're ready. Um, the first speaker is Josefina Martinez, followed by Keith Terry, followed by Margaret Lydon. You have three minutes, and I'll give you a 30-second warning. Thank you. Good evening, uh, board members. Uh, I'm here on behalf of the uh, Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Commission. And um, I'm here uh, in regards to item number seven. And on behalf of the uh, Juvenile Justice Delinquency Prevention Commission, we would like to support the proposed changes as outlined by the uh, Santa Barbara Teen Legal Clinic as to item number seven. Um, and they are um, first offense, five day suspension and referral to other appropriate programs, parent conference and manda mandatory settlement, mandatory counseling referral super program service to be completed within 45 days. Second offense, um, five day suspension and referral to other appropriate programs, parent conference and mandatory counseling referral to teen court, including required assessment and completion by uh, Daniel Bryant, but any other alternative program to be considered. Uh, the, the treatment program is, a pro, uh, if appropriate, or another substance abuse intervention program with mandatory drug testing. And the uh, third offense, a five-day suspension and recommendations for expul uh, expulsion. Um, I would like to support that on behalf of the uh, General Justice Delinquency Prevention Commission. And may I comment? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, if we, uh, if we, uh, if many of the kids get expelled, we will not see them on this photograph. Many, you know, many kids will go to La Cuesta, El Puente. They will not be able to attend college uh, or university. So we won't, we won't see many kids, uh, in, you know, like a photograph like that. So, thank you. Okay, Keith Terry, followed by Margaret Lydon, followed by Kate Moore. Good evening, members of the board. My name is Keith Terry. I'm here representing Why Strive for Youth Inc. Uh, we are a youth-run organization with about 260 members here in Santa Barbara, throughout Goleta and Carpinteria. And I'm here on item seven. Um, you know, I, I have to admit to you <clears throat> that if, uh, if this was enacted when I was in school, 
I wouldn't be standing here before you today with a college degree. I wouldn't have achieved the tools to, to change my life and to see other avenues. Sometimes students just don't get it the first time around. And I don't know if any of you on the board, <clears throat> excuse me, have had indiscretions while in junior high or high school. But if this was in effect when that happened to you, I would hope that was not the case. I think we have an obligation to at least give them a second chance. Maybe not a third, you know, you, you can make that decision, I guess, amongst you, amongst you. But at least a second chance to get more intense help. Because by expelling them from school, it doesn't solve the problem. It doesn't alleviate the, the pain and the hurt that they're um, using illegal drugs or controlled substances to self-medicate. And it definitely won't take it out of the community. Because now you have these students who, like you stated earlier, who are not going to school. And those are the ones that we seem to have the biggest problems with. The ones that have no interaction, no social interaction in school, no um, interaction with teachers or instruction so they can move on and learn more and have a better life. Like I said, we have 263 members. Of that, I would estimate about 75 have been expelled. And they hang out on the street corners. They sleep all day and they basically do nothing. One of our efforts is to get them back in school. But when, when, when a student is given so little guidance and so few chances, it changes their whole attitude. So I ask that, that you adopt the Teen Legal Clinic's recommendation on item number seven, that a student be given at least two full chances with, without possibility of expulsion. And on a third charge, that's something that needs to be considered, I would think. 30 seconds. Okay. So I thank you for giving me this time to speak. And I truly believe you will make the best decision. Thank you. Okay, Margaret Lydon, followed by Kate Moore, followed by Tara Holland Ford. Good evening, Dr. Sarvis and board. My name is Margaret Lydon. And I'm a member, a commissioner on the Juvenile Justice Commission. <clears throat> Pardon me. I'm also uh, on the Mental Health Association board, and I'm also on the Mental Health Commission, and I am uh, the chairperson of the Children's System of Care subcommittee on the Mental Health Commission. So these issues about substance abuse and problems with youngsters uh, using and abusing drugs and alcohol come up in my volunteer work consistently in dealing with the mental health issues of youngsters. I would like to say first off that I recommend that you adopt these, this item number seven, giving the youngster at least two chances. I think I would recommend three, but I don't want to go overboard here. Um, Considering all of the research done, 60 to 70 percent of people with a mental health disorder use and abuse drugs of one kind or another for the purpose of self-medicating. And I think if you find a youngster who is doing this sort of thing, you may have seen a youngster who is self-medicating and masking some serious problems. And it's something I think that should be considered. I'd like to reiterate what Mr. Gonzalez said about Michael Blanchard's research on brain development. These youngsters are coming to a point in their lives when if they are going to, to be symptomatic with a mental illness, especially in boys, it's going to be in this period in their lives. And that by expelling them, you're not only making it less likely that they will be referred to appropriate services, but that they will have more stress and duress and have a psychiatric break of some sort or another. So we're not doing the, the community nor the uh, child themselves any favor. Um, our juvenile hall, and I've spent a lot of time with probation department and also with the mental health 
uh, program manager for juvenile hall services. 30 seconds. Okay. Our juvenile hall has approximately 35% of their youngsters have mental health disorders. So what we're talking about is let's refer youngsters rather than expel youngsters. Thank you very much. Thank you. Kate Moore followed by Tara Holland Ford followed by Jill Sharkey. Thank you. Um, I would just like to bring up a few issues. Um, every time you have a school board meeting, it seems you are deciding several young people's futures. Um, there seem to be about eight, five to eight every time, I'm estimating, and that's a lot. Um, their future is really in your hands if they've been recommended for expulsion, and it's really huge. Um, it seems like every, almost every time they are denied another chance. Uh, I'd like to ask you to please give them another chance. I'm advocating for three chances. Um, if they've been expelled, I'm not talking about for violent crimes, that's a little different. I'm talking about for maybe having a little sip of beer or a puff of uh, weed and they've gotten caught for that. And I'm not talking about real heavy duty troublemakers, just people who have made simple mistakes. Um, I'd like you to remember what it was like when you were young. I know when I was young, it was in the 60s, it was something everybody tried and it was something teenagers just were curious about and I, it seems to be no different today. It's just a curious phase that they pass through and I just really don't think that they should be punished so severely as not being allowed to go back to school. Um, I think uh, as a parent of uh, four young adults, two have already graduated from San Marcos and I have two more in high school. I'd like to say that I have some current first-hand experience with teenagers and with this expulsion process. Um, I've been attending many classes uh, on the effects of drugs and alcohol with my son for the past five months and fortunately he has realized his mistake and he has completely changed his life for which I'm very grateful. Uh, the Daniel Bryant Center runs an excellent program. Peter Galway really understands these kids. He gives them hope. He, he really does a fine job. Um, I, I just don't feel like the school board is giving them enough hope if you kick them out. If they just have two strikes and they have nowhere to go, I just feel like that's too harsh of a punishment. They have to go through six months of uh, repeated lectures, rehab, you know, it's a very long process. I think they have to have a real solid commitment in order to do that, otherwise they would give up. So if, I think if they can accomplish that, then you really ought to give them a chance to come back. Uh, to, to not be allowed to go back to their high school of choice where all their friends are, where they have been maybe with their whole life, uh, is very traumatic. Uh, I don't know if, if you can imagine being a teenager once again and all of a sudden you can't go back with your friends and you have to start somewhere new at 15, 16 or 17. Uh, I would find that very intimidating. For me that would be absolutely horrible. I don't think I could deal with that. 30 seconds. So I feel like there's a lot of kids who are in that situation and they really deserve another chance. These are good kids. I'm seeing a lot of good kids in these programs. Uh, I really hope that you can have com some compassion and really give them another chance because there are a lot of good kids. Um, just briefly, the suspension program doesn't work. Um, they're doing nothing in the suspension programs. They're sitting in a little room. They don't even get their homework. I got my son got a homework once out of 10 days. And uh, they do nothing. It's a waste of time. Perhaps if you implemented the super program in that time, I think a lot of these kids wouldn't have a second offense. I think that time should be used much more wisely. And thank you. Tara Holland Ford, followed by Jill Sharkey, followed by Eduardo Cue. Good evening, board, Dr. Sarvis. Um, the Santa Barbara, I'm here on behalf of the Santa Barbara Teen Legal Clinic. We provided some significant information with regard to number seven. We are advocating um, three chances. I don't think you should label it three strikes. The education code clearly says it's a recommendation for expulsion. It's not an expulsion. It's not a third strike, you're out. It's still a recommendation. We do advocate for you to accept the changes to number seven. However, I do think that some clarification needs to be made with regard to the fact that a parent shouldn't be made to take their child to Daniel Bryant. There should be options for other treatment programs. A parent may want to send their child out of state. I think that should be clarified. Within that, I want to read an email I received from the presiding judge of the Santa Barbara County Juvenile Court, Judge Adams. Dear members of the Santa Barbara School District Board of Education, as a presiding judge of Santa Barbara County Juvenile Court, I am hopeful that you would give positive consideration to the Santa Barbara Teen Legal Clinic's proposal regarding drug and alcohol violations regarding our student population. I strongly favor a restorative justice approach and I appreciate that the 
teen, the teen court program, which I was instrumental in starting in 1992, as an intervention approach designed to help our young people and their families appropriately deal with alcohol and drug violations. On a regular basis, I rely upon the caring and concerned approach taken by Teen Court and Daniel Bryan Treatment Center. Uh, and if any of the board members would like to speak with him, he would be happy to do so, but he could not be here this evening. I also wanted to touch upon the brain of a juvenile. Juveniles' brains do not fully develop until 25. I'm going to read from you an excerpt that's written by the American Medical Association, and it was with regard to a death penalty case, and, it, and they really they really, really linked onto the fact of the, the research that has occurred with regard to brains. Scientists have documented the differences along several dimensions. Adolescents as a group, even at the age 16 or 17, are more impulsive than adults. They underestimate risks and overvalue short-term benefits. They are more susceptible to stress, more emotionally volatile, and less capable of controlling their emotions. In short, the average adolescent cannot be expected to act with the same control and foresight as an adult. Behavioral scientists have observed these differences. Only recently have, are we able to use imaging technology that reveals the regions of the adolescent brain do not reach fully mature state until after the age of 18, and they're actually finding out it's 25. These regions are precisely those associated with impulse control, regulations of emotion, risk assessment, seconds. moral reasoning, and critical development. We need to look at these kids for what they are. They're kids. They make mistakes. And Ms. Parker, I respectfully disagree with you on second offenses. Look at what's happening now. You had a child before you who was expelled on a second offense, no interventions, two offenses in two weeks. That's abominable, absolutely abominable. And if this does go into effect, you should look back at those kids who have been expelled on a second offense, and they should be returned to school and given a second chance. Jill Sharkey, followed by Eduardo Cui. Good evening, members of the board staff of the school district in the community. My name is Jill Sharkey. I'm a uh, researcher and I teach at UCSB in the Department of Counseling, Clinical and School Psychology. I'm a former school psychologist in the district and I'm here to speak on behalf of number seven and the new policy change, but also in terms of discipline in general a little bit. That's sort of my area of interest. Um, and so I would ask you to think about when we're doing discipline, I heard you say discipline a lot, but discipline really is about teaching, especially in the K-12 schools where our children are still developing, um, as Tara mentioned, um, referring to the brain research. It's very true that we need to be implementing things not only for punishment purposes, but really to try to teach children um, as they go through these volatile, volatile times. Children, these youth, don't they make decisions and they don't necessarily understand the long-term consequences. Um, it sounds like we're not also thinking of the long-term consequences of the punishment that we're giving. Uh, the zero tolerance policies that I've spoken about in the letter that you saw isn't just looking at zero tolerance in terms of a definite punishment that's doled out, but in looking at a series of, of recommendations that are going towards increasing punishment, starting with even suspension as a zero tolerance policy. Uh, suspension is another form of excluding students from school without providing them an educational intervention. So I want to just talk a little bit about the impact of zero tolerance um, types of policies in terms of when we exclude students without teaching them the appropriate behavior. Uh, that means that they don't know how to behave when they come back to the school setting, so they don't come back with the skills that improve their behavior when they're there. Um, and this tends to increase um, alienation in the schools and uh, actually promotes poor behavior once they return. They, they don't come back with any increased skills or better behavior. Uh, and so in that, that's a disservice to them, but also to the school climate as a whole. And then when uh, these policies are implemented as well, there's documented effects, uh, negative effects, uh, such as, and one of the main ones is that it's, it may, the school may now not have the problem, but the community does still have that problem. Um, and that really impacts uh, Santa Barbara as a whole. But when we're talking about drug and alcohol use, there's another issue at hand, which is that it's not a social uh, activity necessarily. It's not just something that kids do for fun and they're making a choice to disobey a school rule. It could be, and oftentimes, alcohol and uh, substance abuse is causing a chemical reaction that's addictive and is related to mental health issues and that there needs to be extra care given to this problem because of the need for intensive treatment, the possibility of falling back and recommitting the 
alcohol or drug offense and the need for intensive intervention. So I would highly recommend adopting this policy as one step further in um, using discipline rather than punishment. Thank you. And finally, Eduardo Gray. Last but not least, honorable school board administrators and parents and students in the audience. I uh, am here as the director of delinquency prevention with fighting back and the council on alcoholism and drug abuse in support of item number seven. Um, I look at this approach as by no means, I want, don't want you to consider it as a soft approach to addressing this issue, but it definitely is a smart approach in addressing this issue. When you put young people in front of their peers who scrutinize their behaviors, what it does is two things. It puts the peers in the school that want to have a safe and secure environment so that they can do the things that they need to do pr to progress in education, an opportunity to get into a courtroom to scrutinize the peers that may be causing the obstacles and the problems in front of them. And when they have that bridge that takes together it causes a cohesiveness and an opportunity for these kids to create change because we see that happen. When a sentence of sanctions is imposed by a peer as opposed to an adult, we're seeing, one, a tremendous increase in young people complying and completing what is placed in front of them. When you look at services that are going to be implemented as part of swift interventions to address this issue, you're looking at a client coming back into the court to be part of the process and creating change themselves. You're looking at them give, to providing community service in a retro to take, give back to the community. But more important, they're involved, if it's an alcohol and drug offense, part of it is the assessment that's taken place and there's a continuum and a bridge to the services that are necessary. That might include brief, moderate, or intensive treatment if it's an alcohol or drug issue with high compliance and success of completion. If there's an issue that addresses aggression, there's interventions that fall into that place that are taken care of immediately. And we have a high success of parents that follow up that are involved in parent interventions that participate that. And I can't express to you how strong and powerful it is for that parent to go into courtroom and hear the truths of all truths that evening because that gets an parent that's engaged in being part of the solution because it diffuses the denial, the fear, the shame, or the ignorance that's associated with behaviors that are self-destructive or the circles that they need to change to create seconds. that. So in expressing that and in, in trying to find a solution to address some of the ills that we may be seeing with our young people today, we have a teen court program and a continuum of services that has no match in the United States. And the fact of the matter, we have an opportunity to bridge this with our educational code and to tie it to other services in the community to help those kids connect to services that will make a difference to them. Thank you very much. Ms. Harder. Yeah, uh, Mr. Gonzalez, um, I have some questions. Um, I'm really trying to grapple with this because on the one hand, uh, you know, I, I hear from uh, people in the community who are experts in this area recommending the plan that we see in front of us. The flip side is I've had personal conversations with four school administrators saying, please don't do this. Retain the plan that we have now. Usually when we, when we have a child with us, a student with us on a first offense, it's not the first time that they've had alcohol or usually it's alcohol or marijuana uh, during the school day. They've been under the influence during the school day. It's not the first time. It's probably multiple occasions and on this one occasion they've been caught. So uh, the people who have to enforce the policy aren't buying into uh, what we have in front of us. Now I know that they will enforce the policy if that's what we adopt. Um, but what I gravitate towards is the recommendation from Mr. Blatcher that we somehow uh, deal with junior high to high school as uh, either wiping the slate clean or creating um, some other kind of situation where uh, 
we're not considering the junior high offense versus the high school offenses or the sun, there's some combination thereof, whether it's three offenses. Um, that, but I'm not seeing that delineated here. Now, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe that is embedded in the policy that if all three offenses were in high school versus one offense in junior high and two in high school, I'm not sure how it would work. Um, I don't know if Mr. Blatcher had any specific recommendation. Michael did not, nor was he asked to provide any um, document so we could show you. We, of course, can have Michael provide uh, that language and present it to you. I'd certainly be interested in seeing it. As I said, you know, I'm, I'm hearing, you know, uh, evidence from a group of very well-informed individuals, experts in their field, if you will, um, but I'm also fe feeling like I want to be able to support administrators who have very definite ideas about this and who are the ones who are in the schools having to put these rules into play. Anyone else? <laughs> I think, well, I just had a, a procedural question, and that is, this is on our action agenda, assuming that we were intending to take action on this. It sounds like we're going to be coming, having a comeback. Okay. Um, one of the things that I wanted to, well, if it's going to come back, just maybe we don't need to, but um, there, I, I feel like I would prefer to vote on this in two separate Yes, items, yes. Ha the disciplinary uh, section and the dress code section as two separate uh, We can bring it back that I way. Items. That, yeah. makes, that makes sense. Uh, or we can bring it back together but make two different motions. And whether you want to do one of those tonight, I don't, I don't hear that. I hear bringing them both back. In addition to bringing it back separately, I guess I would like to see with regard to the dress code policy um, I have no specific changes that I would make to it at this point, but I guess it's the training piece that I would like to see some information about connected to the, the uh, change in policy that we're being asked to make. Okay. Dr. I'd like to see number seven separated from the rest of them. Oh. So I, I'd like to be able to vote on number seven separately, whether it's tonight or the next uh, mm -hmm. time back is another issue. But Actually, could we vote on everything but seven, or is that we don't no, feel like we're there? No, just there the opposite. Too many other things. Me. No, I mean everything but seven tonight. No. Okay. Well, we need to have like. But there were some other additions that, that were suggested. That's true. That is true. That's true. Okay. I, I didn't understand your. No, you're right. We can do that when it comes back. We can vote on it any way we want to. But I think okay. that makes sense. I, I, I personally am prepared to vote on seven tonight. Oh, you want to vote on seven tonight? I, I, I'm. I don't want you can make a motion then. Well, I, I think that. I, I don't read the, uh, uh, the rest of my colleagues as being ready for that. No, that's and, why and I, I see I it mean, too. I completely agree with Mrs. Harder, and I would really like to see um, uh, some other permutation of seven come forward to us um, as a possibility. Um, so I would really prefer to wait until that uh, comes forward. And I would agree also. So that sort of does that answer your question? <laughs> I'm accustomed to being outnumbered. <laughs> I just want to thank Mr. Gonzalez for his patience because we've brought this back a number of times. I want to thank the members of the community who wanted to comment on it yes. or, or provide input. That uh, Thank you for being patient with us. Sometimes we change are. is slow, and it may take several iterations. But Our intention will be then to bring it back to the May 13 meeting. 13? Did I get that right? Yes. Okay. We have room, huh? <laughs> okay. Well, it's an important one. A timeout, a break, as it were. Okay, we don't need to do something first before the break. Was this needed to be done? No. We'll do it after the break. We can do it after We'll the do break. it after the break. Okay, we'll take a 10-15 a minute break here. Thank you. Second. Okay, now you want to go, would you be so kind as to start at the top now? In, the, passed, by the way. in yeah. the case of 0708 09, Sorry, thank you. Uh, I move that we uphold the findings and recommendations of the hearing panel. Second. All those in favor? 
Aye. Aye. So that passes four with Ms. Harder absent. Um, I would defer to someone else to. In the case of 0708-45, I move that we uphold the findings and recommendations of the administrative hearing panel. Second. All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Those opposed? I recuse myself, Madam President, uh, on that particular yes. case. Yes, yes. And I'm abstaining on that one. Okay, so we have two in favor, one recuse, one abstain, and one absent. Recusal, <laughs> one abstention, and one absence. But it passed two in favor. A majority. Majority. Uh, is that is that work? And I believe it was. It doesn't uh, need Bob Noel who recused himself. Stealth. And Ed Cordero who abstained. Okay. And Miss Harder who was absent. Okay. In, in the case of 0708-46, I move that the board accept the stipulated agreement. Second. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That passes four with one absence. It's harder. In the case of 0708-47, I move that we accept the uh, findings and recommendations of the administrative hearing panel. Second. Um, it's Parker Noel. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm going to think about this for a second. Okay, all those in favor? Aye. Aye. All those opposed? No. No. So we tie 2-2. Two, 2-2. Two. Two, two. Uh, okay, so, so we just um, will hold that till Ms. Harder is with us to break our tie. So next time. Okay. In the case of 0708-58, move to uphold the findings and recommendations of the hearing panel. Second. So that's um, Parker and Noel. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That passes. I'm sorry, any opposed? No. no. So you voted no. Mm -hmm. Okay. So it passes three in favor, one no, and one absence. And in the case of 0708-66, move to approve the findings and recommendations of the hearing panel. Second. Parker Cordero. All those in favor? Aye. 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 That passes for with one absence. Got them all. We got them all. We did that. Okay. Um, now I'm going to uh, go out of order a little again. Um, because we had a request to address the board, and I can see that that was supposed to happen at, oh, that was supposed to happen at 9.30. So I will wait till uh, we can do a few things before then. You know what? Whoever that is doesn't want to go earlier. I'll wait till 9.30. I think so. Uh, so I'll go back to um, E3. E3. Move to approve uh, with one typo in the last whereas excellent is misspelled. <laughs> we don't want to do that. Yes, that, that has been changed. Thank you. And okay. that is uh, ready for your signature with the correction. We did note that. Second. <clears throat> and we do have two public speakers on this. Okay. Okay. Oh. Um, we have Angela Padilla followed by Lane Wheeler. Hello, I'm here representing Brian Tangway, our president of our classified union. Um, he couldn't be here today, so I'm reading a statement he has prepared. I wish to thank the board for adopting this resolution. I'm proud to, pre to represent the classified employees who provide many diverse services to the students and staff, whether preparing or serving nutritious meals in our cafeterias, repairing leaky faucets, installing and troubleshooting computer systems, assisting students in the classroom, or ensuring that our campuses are clean, safe, and sec secure places to learn. The work, classified, the work classified employees do every day is important and valuable, and I thank the board for recognizing our services, dedication, 
and commitment to the mission of the Santa Barbara School District. Thank you. Thank you for that, and thank you for the classified employees. And Lane Wheeler. As the president of the Santa Barbara Teachers Association, I would also like to extend thanks for the board taking the initiative to recognize our classified brothers and sisters in the trenches. And we would like to thank them and extend our thanks to each of them for the great work that they do in keeping our campuses clean, safe, and secure, keeping our doors and windows opening and closing, and our computers on and off when they need to be, and for the uh, tireless work they do in supporting us in the education of the children of Santa Barbara. So thank you very much to all of our classified members. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, yes. Yes, so we have a vote. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Passes 5 0. I'd like to move that um, we adopt uh, resolution 0708 34, recognizing the day of the teacher, May 14th, 2008, with uh, again a couple of corrections. Oh, okay. um, I, in the fourth, whereas. Good teaching grows in value and pays dividends. I think that's supposed to be far beyond the classroom. <laughs> and also in the second, uh, I'm sorry, the last whereas, the theme of the 20, I think there's the 26th, oh. there should be a T in there. Great, we'll get that corrected and have that ready for you tonight. Okay, thank you. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, and I actually wanted to suggest one other change. Um, in the previous resolution, it remarks about uh, on the uh, excellent professional service provided by CSEA employees, and this resolution doesn't really speak directly to our teachers in Santa Barbara. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm wondering if on the one, two, three, four, five, six, whereas it could read, whereas uh, Santa Barbara teachers represent the best of California's teachers who are among the best educated, most credentialed, and hardest working. Does that make excellent sense? Excellent idea. Okay. I yeah. will. Yeah, and these are these are modeled from their from the CTA. So we'll um, we'll adjust it and mend it with the with CTA's approval. SBTA. So I would accept that as part of the motion. Okay. So we had a we did have a motion and a second. Uh, we don't I don't think second. we've had a second I'll, yet. I'll second it. Okay. And we have a motion and a second. All those in favor. Wait. So oh, we uh, up we have a speaker on this. Of course Mr. we do. Wheeler. Of course. Once again, I'd like to thank the board for this recognition. Um, you have clearly identified many of the positive traits that teachers bring and the service they provide to the students and parents of this district. Um, in a time of uh, severe budget cuts, I would like to ask you each to reach out to teachers at the different sites and, and give them your personal thanks because we um, don't have the ability, I think, with the budget that we are facing from the state and the restraints that we have at the local level to give them the kind of thanks that I know that each of you would want to do in terms of a monetary and uh, uh, benefit statement. So if you could all reach out in that extra way and, and let them know from a one-to-one, human-to-human -human perspective how important they are and, and what value you place on what they do, I think at least that would help try to bridge that and given the, the tough financial times that you face as board members and that teachers face and, and certificate employees face on a daily basis with the student populations and the parent uh, demands that they have, I think that would be an important step. Um, once again, when we enter into negotiations next year, I will hope that you will keep in mind all the important contributions that these same certificated staff have made and we will look favorably on any kind of uh, remuneration issues that we bring forward. So I would thank you for your effort and support of teachers. Thank you. Thank you. All those in favor? Aye. 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 Any opposed? It passes 5-0. Um, related item, last one. I will move to approve, uh, adopt resolution 070835, recognizing May 8, 2008, as Employee Appreciation Day. Second. All those, any, any speakers? No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? It passes 5 0. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I would, l if we can, 
can we go ahead and move on just a second? We could skip over E6 for now. Yep. We could, we could do the defibrillator policy. Okay, let's do that. Let's, it's been sitting on this uh, agenda for so long, <laughs> so tired. Um, F2, the first reading of the board policy and administrative regulations 5141 healthcare and emergencies and automated external defibrillator implementation plan. This is the first reading for your discussion. It's presented by our assistant superintendent, Robin Swaski. Okay. I assume you've looked over the uh, board policy that's actually on healthcare and emergencies. And then we, as you asked, um, we talked about it briefly at one of the board meetings without a board policy, but that you wanted a plan as far as implementation. And um, that's included in the back. You notice that the district nurses are overseeing that, the personnel departments involved. Um, we would begin implementation on the secondary campuses where they have actually received donations of some of the AEDs. Um, so you, I won't read it to you, but I'm sure you've looked over what it entails. I see that Mrs. Harder has a question. No, just a really. I'm sorry, and that is that the, maybe I, I, I went through it too quickly, but I guess I'd like to remind all of us on this uh, particular day of meaning for me that the defibrillators are really for a middle-aged population. They're really not intended for students except in those horrible cases of an athlete experiencing um, sudden death. So the placement of the defib defibrillators really has to do with where you're going to be reaching the largest number of adults. So theaters, gymnasiums, you know, large assemblies of people. So that was the only comment that I, I wanted to throw Good out there. Absolutely, Good thank point. you. Yes, it's intended, of course, it's, you know, broadly students, staff, and community, but you're absolutely right. Um, it's there for that purpose. Um, you notice that we have training. We would, in the board policy, um, the principal should de shall designate which People on staff are the ones who will be trained, who are responsible for it. It's important to note, and I don't know if it, it talks about it enough in the board policy, but there is the liability issue that was in, in 2005, there were questions about liability. And there's now a, um, a, a legal reference that you're not liable when using it if it doesn't work for some reason. So that's, a, that's completely off the board um, as far as you know, as concerned about that. Um, on the, yeah, I can see there's more questions. No, Go no, ahead, no, that's no. fine. The only, the only other thing I want to say, I, I had actually, um, I, I showed it, uh, I showed it to my husband. Mm -hmm. Good, like, that's like great. He knows everything there is about <laughs> AEDs, right? Um, uh, but the only other comment that he made was, you want to make certain that in any training um, or implementation on a campus, that the first thing somebody does is call 911 and not yeah. go for the defibrillator. The first thing they Good should point. do is call 911. Right, and so have you, that. <laughs> it's just we don't want to forget basic skills when we're reaching for the technology. Right. Well, I can show you too the um, along with this whole file, there's another big binder that the nurses have been working on in regards to this and all of the training. And you know our nurses, they have. <laughs> really research this well and every avenue of it and so they would be um, very a big part of the training and that kind of um, advice as far as 911. Um, you can see that the fiscal impacts very small um, the um, the setup costs we've worked with with uh, David Hetyonk on what the cabinets would cost and all of that and then the ongoing training um, but we need to make sure that all those pieces are in place. And um, again, knowing the nurses, you know that they will make sure that every little detail, every you know, I will be dotted and T will be crossed. Um, but they're very anxious to get this going. So it is a first reading because it's a board policy and administrative regulation, and we've added the plan. So please, any questions, comments, anything I can take back to um, add to it or um, clarify something. We have a speaker. We do have a speaker. Oh, I, great. I'm sorry. I had a, I had mm -hmm. a quick, well, I, don't, I hope it's a quick question. <laughs> I was just wondering if this is um, 
something that's embedded in law. Uh, on page one of two, uh, the first page of the AR, mm -hmm. um, the last paragraph says the caregivers, and it talks about caregivers being able to um, sign an affidavit for, for students that would either authorize them to receive the care or refuse to receive the care. Um, but at the, the last paragraph, it says, the caregiver's consent to medical care shall be superseded by any contravening decision of the parent or other person having legal custody of the student. And I'm wondering, who would be the caregiver if somebody else has legal custody of the student? Well, I'm trying to think of a particular situation. And, and it says they've completed a caregiver's authorization. So I'm assuming at some point some, a student or a child in our system is living with someone else and they've been officially designated as the caretaker. We, we do have a number uh, of students who are living with don't live. I guess right. my question was, is there some legal like, definition of caregiver or who qualified, who, who I, who's identified as a caregiver? I, I, I don't know whether there is, uh, but this is the code language. Okay. Okay. I mean, my understanding is that this is directly from code. Okay. I didn't look that piece up. I can put that can in a board brief out. or something if you'd like me to. If, if you could out put it in a board brief, I sure. would, that would be great. When, Thank it, you. when it comes back, be able to answer that. Or I can, that's true. Mm -hmm. Whatever's first. We'll see it yeah. again. <laughs> we'll see this again. Okay, we have Lane Wheeler. Thank you. Um, well, I believe that this is a, a worthy important a procedure to establish on school site campuses and since you have a, a very small impact financially on on the budget with this um, we teachers in general uh, support the idea of having emergency procedures and and equipment to handle those kind of conditions on campuses when I shared this with the uh, representative council which is rep has representatives from every site at the meeting there was almost an overwhelming uh, sigh of um, of um, non-compliance with the uh, overall arching consideration of who might be delivering these kinds of services from considerations of liability which uh, you know the con the uh, the uh, policy seems to address with some regards but just that that teachers are already teaching they're already in charge of making sure that the testing requirements are met we have all kinds of other responsibilities given to us to then have life-saving procedures that include administering electric shock to a person, um, it just felt like it might be one more thing. And I guess I, the message I would bring back to you is while teachers support the general uh, idea of safety on campus, uh, we would ask you to investigate very clearly and to uh, seek out public opinion from the teachers on this in regard to um, how this procedure would be uh, implemented who those identified parties would be, and uh, what other um, conditions we might run into in, in the administration of the defibrillator portion of this. So please give this more consideration before it's adopted and seek out more folks. I know the nurses, which are part of our unit, have been working on this, but I, I sometimes think that they uh, address things from a medical perspective and not from the more day-to-day -day perspective of one teacher and 35 students in a classroom, and this has to happen. So please just give this more consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to address it? Would teachers? I guess I, I, guess I would not. make a comment based on that, and that is that it's highly unlikely that a teacher would be delivering this service to a student. It is much more likely that a teacher would be delivering this to a fellow teacher. Absolutely, teacher. and then there, as as uh, Lane mentioned, there are specific. The principle is to specify exactly who those identified people would be, employees that would be around for sports activities, night events, that kind of thing. And then there would be, a, you know, people on staff that would be trained in the event that a fellow teacher um, needed that. Um, there is language in the in the contract. I'm sure Lane's aware of it. That gives that does say occasionally unit members may be assigned to backup as backup to perform specialized health care services. Um, so there's language there, but absolutely would, would not want teachers to be thinking that's part of their regular duties and, you know. 
Yes, yeah. right, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Anything else? Then we'll move on and we'll see that again. Um, we're going to move back now to F1, the request to address the board by C.J. Kennedy um, from the Santa Barbara High School Transition Program uh, student. Um, yeah, uh, I'm C.J. Kennedy and uh, I want to present to the board a video that um, I made. So um, if you guys can please play the video. Yeah. I'm CJ Kennedy, and what I'm going to try to do is change the world by getting the transitions program a uh, permanent classroom. Because I feel that um, pretty much for too long have we like, been hopping classroom to classroom. And I feel as though nothing is being done about it, and the needs to be put to a stop. And I pretty much know that most of the cl times in this um, classroom that we're sometimes kicked out early because there's a, another class coming in. Um, and I know that one of the features in the transitions program is practically using a truck that was many offices. I'm like, pretty much second generation of, of activists. My grandmother, Shirley Grace Kennedy, was pretty much the first. And she works hard to get where she is today. And I promise you that by the time this is all over, when we lose a draw, that I will get the transitions program a permanent home no matter what it takes. Very good, C. Thank you, C. Very good, C. Very good. Because 
found in that very class. Please sign your name to support a permanent classroom for the transition room, uh, program. And also, please uh, wear this ribbon in support of uh, getting a classroom. Thank you. teachers and all the supplies they need are always on the move, but now those involved in the program are calling on school administrators to give them a room. Senior reporter John Palm and Terry spent the morning with the class. This is the way the transition program offered at Santa Barbara City College starts its day in transition. Supplies are hauled in by cars, then wheeled to the campus. Well, the teachers don't have on-campus parking. They drag their supplies across the street and through the school property to a portable room where about 30 students show up. These students are 18 to 22 years old and are still trying to get a high school diploma. They were behind, but the program is aimed at trying to get them caught up and eventually employed. There you go, now you have enough room. There, perfect. Look at that. Just right. But the class does not have its own room, and it's unsettling. Oh, you got the contract. The activity plan? Um, it's moving regularly, sometimes daily, sometimes more than once per day. We start out in one of these buildings, and we have to move all of our stuff at lunchtime because a city college class comes in. We have to go and put everything in the office and then go get it out at the end of lunchtime and put it in to the other classroom. One student has a petition. Uh, keep in mind, I will fight for this thing and get you guys a room no matter what the heck happens. City College President John Romo says space is tight on campus, and since the program is technically not a city college course, we show them the room schedule and show them each semester they can, when you don't have classes scheduled, classrooms that they can use. And In Santa Barbara, John Palmentary, Key News. And despite the classroom challenges, nine students have been able to use the courses to get jobs this year. Since Santa Barbara City College uses Dos Pueblos, San Marcos, and Santa Barbara High campuses for their adult ed classes, and they get ample use of parking at these facilities, um, that's the transition program was decided was going to be allowed to use City College space. And we have received an office but we would like to have a dedicated classroom and not just hop around from classroom to classroom, which we do right now. And since the ample amount of real estate that the school district allows City College to use is so vast compared to what we're asking for, one dedicated classroom, it, it seems like the students deserve more. I'm CJ Kennedy, and uh, I am a transition student here. 
I work in the SBCC cafeteria. Uh, I have a few uh, classes on this campus as well. Uh, hospitality, sanitation, and safety. Hi, I'm CJ Kennedy, and what I'm going to try to do is change the world by getting the. Good. Um, I also um, have a uh, petition that's uh, back there on the uh, counter over there. If uh, it, feel free to sign it if you guys want. Um, but pretty much the more signatures, the better. So, anyway, thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you. That was wonderful. Anyone else? Any other comments? Well, I, I just have a question for, I suppose, I don't know if it's for Dr. Starvers or Mr. Hedyank. Um, has the district ever met with City College about this issue? We have. Um, well, Dave, you may want to take that up as well. Um, I met with City College a couple of years ago because uh, we didn't have office space uh, on the campus. And uh, we pointed out that uh, we had a very disparate use of district facilities versus city college facilities. We have not met on this issue specifically, but we are negotiating an MOU. And the MOU, just like our MOU with the city, calls for the different parties to, to deliver certain services. Dave? That's correct. We've had uh, we have had several meetings uh, with City College on the MOU, and now that we have uh, Eric Smith on board, and he has a little bit of a little bit of time on his hand now that we've adopted the recovery plan uh, between he and myself and and uh, Mr. Price, we will resume those negotiations. And finding a permanent space for the transition program is definitely a part of that MOU negotiations. Uh, could you uh, can you say anything more about closure, a timeline? Uh, I would hope to have something to bring to the board this summer. This summer, so they so we would have something in place for the beginning of the next school year. Yes. I just want to thank you very much for your presentation. Yeah. Uh, that was terrific, and I, I hope you heard what you just said. <laughs> <laughs> Wonderful. Thank you very much. Okay. Um, we have uh, some choices here. I'm, um, because of the time, uh, I'd rather go to F3 than go to policies if... Um, at this point, unless somebody has uh, some disagreement with that. So it, we're down to, well, right? Are there, there any speakers here on either of these? Hmm? Right. We have our choices are E6 or F3. and. Unless I hear an objection, I would rather do F3. Uh, is that, are you just talking about the order or? No, I don't, I'm, terminate I F am thinking F3 that we are not gonna have time for both since it's one's 40 minutes and one's 20 minutes and I don't think we have time for both. Although you never know, right? <laughs> we never know. But I'm gonna go with F3 and we'll see if we have time for the other. Okay, so it's the mission statement. Well, the current board mission statement was adopted, district mission statement was adopted about uh, 12, 13 years ago. Uh, it, by board policy, we are to consider renewal of the mission statement on a periodic basis. I've, as I recall, it was, what, five years, every five years. 
And we have done some work uh, to show this within the context of board focus goals. We did have a strategic plan that was developed during the years of Mike Kasten. Uh, it's on our website, although as, a, as an operational um, uh, policy, uh, you know, we're, we're not going back to the strategic plan at this point in time. We have focused tremendously on the board focus goals, and you see that when we bring you school plans and talk about school progress, we always talk about them within the context of those board focus goals. We also did some work, thanks to Barbara Chiani, in looking at mission statements from other districts. We included some of the comparable school districts and some other districts in our area. The idea here was that we would do the mission statement and then next do the goals. And that's why I'm bringing this here today so that we can get to the goals, which was also supposed to be done in the spring. And we're getting toward the end of spring here. So um, if I could just make one quick comment before we start the discussion, yes. and that is um, when school services uh, presented us with their their plan, their health analysis, comparative analysis and efficiency study. On page 12 of that, there was a, a pretty nifty discussion of, uh, and it, it involved a recommendation, and I know you guys don't have it in front of you right now. Um, the district should continue working on its strategic planning process, whereby the, the district's overall mission and long-term educational goals are developed and updated each year. This should be done in the fall of each year, and it goes along to give a timeline, and it has that little circle It looks like a target. But essentially, it talks about the importance of reviewing and updating the plans in conjunction with the entire uh, budget cycle so that your mission statement and goals are linked to the budget cycle. Sounds like an, ide Oops. Sounds like an ideal world. <laughs> Um, but it sounds good. I mean, that's where we should be moving. Um, and we haven't goals every year. We've been doing them kind of bigger goals that are kind of sitting there. And I, I do feel like we need goals that are more targeted for that particular year that we check off. But that's my own personal kind of focus. I'd rather see more immediate. But Well, I feel like uh, having read the fiscal recovery plan and, and also the School Services of California's report that oddly enough I'm kind of feeling like we're ahead of the game finally uh, and just starting to d this discussion now. <laughs> 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 we're either way, way behind, which we really are, but we're also <laughs> ahead. So I'm, I'm pleased that this is coming now since this will be a discussion that goes on over time. Um, I have one more thing that in terms of mission statements, um, Ms. Cordero, you probably experienced this as well, that the newest thing in, in mission statements is not so much about what we um, do, but rather the outcomes and what we want to get. And you can see that among these examples, that some of them focus on what we do, such as, let's see, um, Tustin is the old-fashioned um, an education system characterized by challenging, exciting curriculum, inspiring instruction. Um, same thing with Ventura, that we will educate all students. These are things that we will do versus, where's one where it's uh, uh, Monterey Peninsula. Students will attain the intellectual, social. It's, it's a, just a slightly different focus. Also, po Poway. I don't, yeah, I, I actually don't think it's a small focus. I think it's a big difference. It's, it's focused on what you know, uh, members of the teaching community and administrative team, et cetera, will do, but it, it doesn't have, it, it doesn't uh, involve any kind of outcome at all. And in yeah. many instances, really barely mentions students at all. <laughs> so exactly. I would like to, f I, I would like to, well, I like the shorter ones better, but exactly. also. Uh, San Diego Unified then? Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> Let's do it. Um, but Just do it. I, I guess I would like to, to uh, focus on uh, or come up with something that focuses on um, student outcomes. 
do we has anything yet been no we don't have anything kind of a, a um, draft or anything like that do we I think that's what you are hoping for yes, but I, I think will. that is something that a board does together and one board <laughs> member does not do on their own <laughs> Ms. Cordero did you ask well, I was just going to chime in with I think that the mission statement that we have does address outcomes because it says so that students will and then it lists the things that students will accomplish. However, I feel like it sort of lacks heart and soul. It, it's very business-like to me. Um, I thought that the Poway Unified School District uh, mission best. statement had a little bit more that uh, the students will master the knowledge and develop the skills and attitudes essential for success in school and in a diverse society. Um, and I was, I was trying to figure out a way that we might take some, th then there's a couple of others that also have, I think, a little bit more of the sort of the passion um, in the mission statement. And I was wondering if there might be some way that we might combine somehow this sense of what we want to achieve with this sort of um, more I don't know, affective language for the, for the mission statement. And maybe I'm, I don't know, maybe it's more of a vision statement, but I'd kind of like to see some of that in our mission statement. Yeah, I don't like the, I, I, uh, as soon as you say outcomes, I think of measurable outcomes and I can tick off a list of about 25 different measurable outcomes, all of which would be very boring on that summer. <laughs> okay. and, and none of which would be attainable uh, uh, in the short term at any rate. Uh, but it seems to me that, that, that the idea still is something, it's, it's an aspiration toward an end state. And, and uh, to find some way to describe that end state that is not so particular and yet not so vague, uh, you know, general as to be vacuous mm -hmm. and vague. Exactly. But there's an end state. Exactly. There's something about the language in ours where, where we say we'll provide professional instruction and guidance, <laughs> which just sounds very, so. Very passive. Yeah, very passive, very. Um, well, like <laughs> we're not striving. For the <laughs> we're not reaching for the stars there. <laughs> um, you know, we're, we're, we're shooting for professional, um, which to me seems like it ought to be a given. Um, we should be, I, I feel like our mission statement should shoot for the stars a little more. Any suggestions? Look like you're about to say something. No, no, no. <laughs> I, I, no, I, I don't know if, if it would be appropriate to form a subcommittee to come up with something to bring it back for board discussion. Um, I think it probably would. It's probably it's it would, too hard to do it this. It would be difficult to do this at, at, with five of us at a, at a board meeting in okay, a few minutes. Okay, then we need two people who would be interested in doing this that sort of, I know, that sort of, I think I got a sense that Poway was kind of a, a starting point, at least. It could be an ingredient. An ingredient of it. Can I encourage uh, anyone to do this? I can see that if Mrs. Harder is willing to work on it, I will work on it with her. <laughs> sure. Ah, uh. oh. <laughs> we have a willing volunteer. <laughs> Okay, then we will put this back on the agenda. I feel like we're not moving forward. We are moving forward. Um, that was a small step, but we got there. Okay, um, is there any way I can interest you in, um, in, <laughs> in E6? <laughs> let's, <laughs> I hear next to me, let's do it. Well, I, it's a second reading, so I'm not sure why we can't. Okay. Yeah. Okay, I. Um, Thank you. <laughs> um, I'd like to know, it's really hard from this, this to tell where the major changes are, so if somebody would sort of help us through that. Uh, the, uh, you mean the changes since our last meeting? Yes, yes. There were well, there. 
gosh, there really wasn't anything. However, I do need to hand one thing to you, and that was that because of the uh, discussion about legal review of contracts, um, we asked for some legal input on that. <laughs> and I guess as a, as a corollary to that, I need to, I need to ask your help. Um, part of my bud budget cutting effort on my part has to do with legal services and has to do with uh, consulting services. And if we have unnecessary legal services, it merely adds to the budget. So is what we have is a message from Craig Price. He could not be here tonight. He had a family emergency, I believe. Um, he says, you've asked my advice regarding the necessity for legal counsel to review all district contracts. While there is no such requirement under state law, our former board policy, former board policy 3312, adopted in 1988, contains such a requirement. That's how we got it, and board members asked that question. So where did this come from? Is that state law? However, new board policy 3312 deletes that provision. The current practice is for contracts to be reviewed by legal counsel on a case-by-case -case basis, depending on whether issues of significance are identified by the superintendent or designee. In certain cases where form contracts are appropriate, they are drafted or reviewed by legal counsel before general use is made. The current practice avoids unnecessary legal expenses associated with review of routine contra uh, contracts which do not pose risk to the district, in my view. The current practice provides adequate protection to the district and works well. But isn't this related to when we were discussing board policy 3000 series? Why does it have to do with 7000? Oh, oh my gosh. Yeah, it, it, it does, but it also, if I may interrupt, d does relate to the architecture and engineering contracts with the, with okay. the 7000 series. And, and in fact, uh, uh, in the last few board meetings, you have approved some architectural assignments and uh, Mr. Price has, has reviewed the standard I AIA contract that we use for those assignments, and he's also uh, viewed the uh, changes to those contracts, which became standard of those contracts afterwards. So he wanted to bring that forward while we talked about the 7000 series, because the 7000 series does involve uh, uh, approving contracts. Uh, okay. That is true, though. We were considering the 3000 series as well. And we will yeah. have specific language in the 3000 series. Okay. Yeah. Should I go through this by page, or does anybody have any comments that they want to just? I think it has worked faster when we just go through page. Okay. And I'd like to make one comment, yes, if I could. Please. I do apologize for the order of the attachments, which is not the same as the order listed in the agenda item. Uh, when these were collated, the person doing the collating listed in the attachments all the ARs first and all the BPs second. Oh, that's what that's about. So we're really oh. attempting to confuse you tonight. <laughs> so it's going back and forth. But I do have in front of me the page numbers. If you wanted to go through them by board policy number, I can refer you to that page, or you can go through the pages as they are in the attachments, whatever your pleasure. What would you like? Just run through the way it is, the way it's in here? Or you, you see people moving them around. I'm sorry. It seems a little bit easier could, yeah, to could look at the po board policy and the AR together. Okay, yeah, so we okay. can recollate that. Okay. okay. For, for, first is board policy 7000, page so 19. It has no AR. So if you start with 19 and the back of 19 is 20, then you go to 21. Wait. With the back being 22. Okay. I'm sorry, what are you saying? Start with 19. So if we're, if we're recollating, just put 19 well, as the first thing. Yep. Okay. Yep. Just tell us the pages. So go to, then, then page 21. Then Dave, is one next? One is next, you're correct. You're ahead of me. One is next. Then I can put it on the screen. Yeah. Then three. Then three. 
23, 25, 3. Wait, doesn't really work. Wait, 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 wait. <laughs> three it doesn't really work because things lost. are going back and forth on the pages, so it really doesn't work to do it like that. What do you mean? Well, here it, it says. Oh. Yeah, the back it of one the and the front of another. Yeah. Oh, so no. Yeah, so. oh. Just, just pull them out. Put them, put them next yeah. to each other. That'll be okay. You know, I follow along on this. The, you know, <laughs> rather than waste time, uh, let's put it on our next agenda. <gasps> <laughs> we will make sure they're collated I don't correctly. Think, I don't think it's we can run through them then. Signposts, big signposts. In order, yes. <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, does anybody have any comments before we, no, <laughs> I guess we can't do it that way. Okay. I, I, I would, I have a comment on one that would, I'm sure <laughs> Mr. Hedgeon could clarify my, diff my problem. Uh, it has to do with uh, 7215. What page number? <laughs> oh, page 34. I'm looking at AR. Page AR, 17. page 17. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. No, I, it, doggone, now I lost it. It was a term. <laughs> it was a, a, a term. A, uh, ah, here we go. 34? No, no, no. I don't know what the page number is. Social, a school facilities needs analysis. Is that the same thing as a long-range facilities plan? School facility needs analysis would be. The, the, I'm reading from AR 7211, which is page seven. Uh, in a nutshell, yes, it would be what we would typically also call a condition assessment, uh, assessing assessing the facility, finding out what is deficient and, and what the needs are to bring it up to standards. This is repeated so many times; it sounds like it's a document. But it and, is a and, document. And, it's only part of a facility's uh, master right. plan, correct? I just wanted correct. to key the language yeah. together because I know what a facility's master plan is, yeah. and it, and if this is a subset of that, it'd be nice to have those have the cross referencing. Uh, as part of the Williams settlement, we're required now to assess facilities on an annual basis, and and so that is as a basic assessment of deficiencies. On on top of that. You can do a more detailed assessment that we typically call a, a condition assessment or condition analyses of, of, uh, of the long-term deferred maintenance type things that may not be evident to the naked eye that we know we'll be doing in the future. In addition to that, a, a third layer on top of that would be a, as part of a facilities master plan or, or a bond fund planning for, for a bond issue. Uh, uh, needs to address changes in curriculum and updating curriculum and adapting the sites to ever-changing curriculum and, and needs of the school. I'm just going so back at the first question. Okay. Well, he was talking about developer fees as part of the, when you're, when okay. you're yeah. well, doing Okay, if you're, if you're talking specifically about developer fees, yeah. th then, then you're talking, then you're talking about uh, a new construction and modifications to the facility uh, to meet to meet uh, a curriculum requirements. It just was as all I'm, all I'm saying is that it wasn't clear because this was not capitalized school facilities needs analysis. Hmm. Whether you were referring to a particular document now, I, if I understand, not, not you, a it's a document the state requires. Well, uh, I, the the one for developer fees would be a different document, so yeah. it would be small letters. It, it would be of our design, okay. and that would be part of the uh, developer fee justification study. Okay, but, all right, uh, because this, whatever that, whatever it is, capital letters, small letters, mm -hmm. this calls for it to be brought to the board for approval. Correct. Okay, that's. But it sounds like something that's new, and so that's I, why we. I don't, see, I don't remember ever doing that before. He okay. said it. Well, we, have, we haven't done a developer, developer fee justification study in, in quite some time. And now with Smith or Smith on board, we're looking into doing that to, to be able to justify or not justify raising the fees. And as part of that study, you must do this type of assessment. And, and that study all comes to the board. Okay. Thank you. Because that was on, I've never seen one of those. I, I apologize for going around. I didn't realize you were talking specifically about developer fees because I didn't turn no, to I was talking about that 70, page. 7211. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Any other comments before we move on and, yeah. I just wanted to point out that if we are willing to um, not necessarily be consistent in whether the board policy comes first or the AR comes first, 
um, we can put these in order. Oh. Okay. Do you want is the board willing? No, I see. No, only because when you actually approve something, the board policy comes before the administrative regulation. So we, it, we normally don't we approve ARs. We usually we usually uh, they uh, uh, come as a package. So yeah, you'd have to look at the board policy first and then backtrack to the AR. I don't it doesn't make any difference to me. We we could do that. Yeah, that's fine. If, if you want, if you would like me to, I'll give you the order of the pages. Okay. Should we write that, Barbara? Should we write this down so we can put it on the overhead? Okay. Okay, so I'm just gonna, uh, you, you'll know what the back side of the page is, so I'll just yeah. give you the front side of the page. Perfect. 19, 21, 1, 23, 3, 25, it's the same thing. 5, Twenty. Now this one seemed a little weird, but twenty-seven, and we might have to look at that one again. Um, I'm sorry, Annette, can, can you repeat? Starting from where, the whole thing? Yeah, I, I thought you were following what was up there. No, no, I'm giving you a. Nineteen twenty-one. So nineteen twenty-one one, one twenty-three. 23 okay. Then three. Then 25, then 5, 27, 29, 7, 9, 11, 13, 15, 31, 33, 17, 35. No, no, I will. I go by the well, BPs and the ARs. Okay. I, okay. Now I get to go by pages here, right? Mm -hmm. So, any comments on pages 19? 20 or 21 or 22. Yeah, we probably won't have comments on 22. Okay, any comments on 1, 2, 23, and 24? I'm not stopping at any particular place here. Nope. 3, 4, 25, 26, 5. I, I find this, I, I find this very irrational. Oh, oh. Too fast. Oh, oh I'm sorry. Okay. I'll go, uh, I'm, I'm happy to go back. Um, can we go but, by board policies? Uh, well, we've, oh, we've all put them into this order. What? Yeah, I see the numbers, but I did not reorganize mine that way. Would you no. like? Would you, Why don't you I mean, I, 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 I think this should have been staffed better and should have been brought to the board, as Dr. Sarvis just said a little while ago, and I thought that was all settled. We're sitting up here spending 20 minutes shuffling paper. Well, if it's we, we all have ours done now. Well, that's congratulations, madam. Do you want to simply go through and identify not only the page number, but okay. the board policy? All right. Board policy 7,000. Sounds like a beginning. Uh, the policy or reg number and the page number. Okay. Okay, I'll do both. And then board policy 7110, which is on page 21 on facilities master plan. And that goes on to 22. And it has an, the AR on page 1. 
7111. The next board policy is 7131, Relations with Local Agencies, and page 23. 24. The AR with that 7140 is on page 3, Architectural and Engineering Services. 24. The Board Policy 7140, Architectural and Engineering Services on page 25. And 20 BP 71, oh, is that, yeah, 7150. AR 7150 is on page 5. We're on site selection and development. We all don't have a lot of comments here, so I, I um, I'm 27. But now this yeah, is we're where we're we had the qu where I had the question because yeah, it's stuck right in the middle of it. But that's it's stuck. Yeah. The previous page 26 leads to 27. Exactly. Yeah. So the top of page 27 is a continuation of board policy 7150. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and did you have a comment about one of those? No. No. Nope. Anybody have no. a comment on anything here? Um, then board policy 7210 on facilities financing. Page 28. 28 and 29. For a board policy. I'm sorry, I just wanted, I did have just a quick question yeah. on 7210. Yeah. And that is, it seemed to me that all of those items are pretty much prescribed by code. Do we have any flexibility in any of those? Not much. Okay. I mean, it's okay with me if we no, don't. I yeah, just, I mean, wondered if there was something I was overlooking. It, they're pretty much prescribed. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. Well, we have board policy 7211, which is about developer fees. And the AR on developer, on developer fees is AR 7211 on page 7. So we have page 30 and page 7. That was the one I... Ah, okay. Yeah. Well, we already... Did you have anything else there? Or, or did you get your questions answered? Well, I, if you'd allow me time to read my oh, notes. Sure, sure. I don't carry it all in my head. <laughs> uh, when we talk about public facilities, and I, uh, number three, up the top, level of funding. Uh, does that include uh, undeveloped land? No, we do not collect uh, developer fees on undeveloped land. We only collect uh, developer fees when there is an approved building permit by a county or city. Okay. And you clarified my questions about the uh, school facility needs analysis. So we, we will be going through this process then? That was what I was missing as I read this uh, 70, this, this particular one. Yes, we are. Uh, none of this sounded familiar to me, and I've been on the board a long time. And, uh, right. Uh, I came to the district in 2000, and the last uh, needs analysis and developer fee justification study, uh, I believe, was done prior to when I arrived here. Yeah, okay. It's time to update it. All right, thank you. That, that, uh, that's, those are my questions on that one. On AR 7211. Okay, uh, so that's page where eight and nine and ten and eleven and twelve, and then we get to the AR 7214 on general obligation bonds on page 13 and 14, 15. Wait, hold on a minute. Okay. 
I, I have I have for some time been of the opinion that we should revise our criteria for our advisory committees uh, consistent with post Prop 39 rather than we com we compose them according to rules that predated Prop 39, okay. and it has to do with with uh, with the uh, composition of the committees. The oversight committee. Yeah. The yeah. bond oversight committee you're talking yeah. about? Yeah. There's like four hundred thousand dollars out of sixty-seven out of you know almost million. gone. It's Job almost, almost gone. over. Job is wi yeah. really winding down. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Uh, then then what I'm talking about will be right. automatic. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. Correct. Okay. Yeah. Fine. Thank you. As a matter of fact, uh, they were talking about the need to meet on a regular basis, or extending the meeting dates to every other month. And they will probably go to four times a year because there's so little to get done in yeah. that yeah. bond oversight committee. Okay, thank you. That was all I had on that one. Okay, 14, 15, 16. Um, now on to BP 7214, which is on page 31. Bonds requiring <coughs> 32, 33. And then we have BP 7215 on page 34 on fundraising for the purpose of augmenting bond funds, which we've, seems like we actually <coughs> updated this pretty recently. I had a lot of questions on this one. Okay. Is, is, is this, uh, it seems, it, it, the the bottom of page 17 should say AR if you uh, the very mm -hmm. bottom yeah, yeah, AR is, yes. is on 17 uh, but starting with the board policy uh, should this be so specific as to say bond funds because like, don't we have other instances where we've approved fundraising like the theater improvements at Santa Barbara High School uh, did that involve bond, bond funds? You're, you're correct, Dr. Noel, that we, we have uh, yeah. fundraising going on right now, augmenting, uh, well, I take that back. Uh, the money funds. that we get in matching funds for our career, career technical education is state bond funds. Yeah. The, the theater at Santa Barbara High also included some bond funds because of the ADA, ADA upgrades. But it seems to me but, this ought to be more general in any event. We can, oh. unless, unless we can... Unless well, you it could is inconceivable that we're going to have fundraising to match something we, else, we could easily take out the word bond and put capital. But doesn't doesn't this appear somewhere else? I was for just other about to say we have yeah. other board policy See, related to fundraising. That's uh, not fund funds. Well, th this is relate. This was our own peculiar one related to bond funds because there were groups but that came forward. But there the, are the other discussion we have is another policy altogether. Correct. Oh, but this looks this looks very similar. Very. And it has the same 75% and so forth. Well, may we talk about the uh, the uh, AR then? Mm -hmm. uh, it seems to me that, especially given what was said earlier tonight about uh, when Dr. Sarvis talked about the uh, elevators and that the money only goes about half as far, uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, we, that this formula for uh, how much, uh, setting the target, mm -hmm. and then the time that lapses between the time of uh, setting that target, the fundraising, and when you actually start construction. Yes. Uh, you know, I, was, I was doing some mental arithmetic on the Peabody thing, and I think we lost money uh, in terms of the, the value of, the, of, the, of those dollars at the, at the time we lent them, the cost, what that, that money would buy now. Well, yeah. uh, we didn't collect interest on that money. That, we could have I'm had not talking interest. I'm okay. just talking about inflation. You know, be, could be. You know, I, would never, I would never charge them interest, but, but I think we lost just in terms of the time that, that, uh, that passed mm -hmm. and, how, and what the money, when we finally get it back, will buy. Uh, it, won't, it won't buy that what you had hoped for when you first came on the board something for Adam's library. Uh, I remember your eyes glittered when we saw $700,000 there, but it's just not gonna be there. Uh, so I, I, by, anyway, my point is simply that, that this needs to be more dynamic. Uh, 
it needs to have a, a some kind of a, uh, a sliding fundraising schedule uh, or, or projections of, of cost increases that that that, that are keyed to, so that when they repay. I'm not making myself very clear, but do you get the idea? I think, yeah, I know exactly okay. what you're talking about. Okay. Is is that, I don't know if Mr. Hetyonk would be able to come up with I, some kind of. I think that's why we have the 75% in there where that didn't apply before during the Peabody situation. Well, we plugged that in after Peabody, didn't we? Yes, Correct. and that's the difference, it really. And, and then believe. we immediately ran into the Dos Pueblos pool uh, where the. Uh, we dove into that. <laughs> That's right. Where, where the bids came in and they were huge. And we weren't anywhere near it. Correct. Right. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I worry about the 75%, but I can, I can picture a $4 million project where we, we have to pick up 25%. This could hurt a lot uh, under best of times, not to mention now. So you know, yeah. it gets here. It is. It's already. It's it's too far to back yeah. down. I, I think it's in, if I can interrupt, Dr. Noel, not to, uh, make a statement. I think it's incumbent upon the people that are raising the funds to convince the Board of Education that they are capable of raising the additional 25 percent when they're given approval to and of, of a construction contract when they have 75 percent. And I think a good case in point would be the, the Santa Barbara High School Theater Foundation. Uh, when we renovated that theater, uh, they proposed raising money for the seats. Uh, at the beginning of that uh, project, they had 75% of that money in the bank. They convinced you that they would be able to raise the other 25%, and they did raise the other 25% well before the completion of the project. Mm -hmm. So By the time we had to pay it to the contractor. Right. So, 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 so I, I, I think I it's incumbent upon it. the fundraising group to convince the board they're good for the 25%. Well, I, but Prudent planning also looks at the alternative possibilities. Correct. Sure. And, 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 what, and, and, if you're, and if you're into something for sizable amounts of money and they can't do it, then, you're in the, then you have this dilemma that I personally, hate, as a board member, hate to be in that spot. Because then you're, then, and I remember having that feeling uh, with some, right. you know, having to say, look, I really think this is a project that ought, ought to go forward, but I don't see that we, there's, there's a high risk uh, or a certainty right. that we're going to have to pick up the difference. It, it, it's like a bank. You have, you have proven customers and you have new people coming to you. Well, and you see and what's you happening to. with the bank. <laughs> yep. Ms. Cordero. So. Well, I was just going to say, I think that's sort of incumbent upon, I think I'm echoing what you were saying, uh, Mr. Het Young, that it's sort of incumbent upon the board then to take all of that into consideration before we go forward, before we allow them to go forward when we approve the fundraising process or what the, uh, this whole notion of uh, going forward with a project, right. before we encumber any funds, we need to be convinced that it's a, it's a prudent, it's prudent financially to go forward. And if we are convinced, then yes, there is a risk involved, but unfortunately there's, yeah. most financial right. obligations that we undertake have some f level of risk. Um, and we try to minimize that risk Correct. with how much we require the pr the proposers to be able to document um, that they have the wherewithal to com to complete the fundraising as they've laid it out to us. Right. If we if we are not convinced that they can do that, then we simply reject their proposal. Right. You could, you could easily increase the 75% to a higher number and then make exceptions for a lower number. Uh, there's a lot of considerations, including the length of the project. I mean, if, if somebody is fundraising a large amount of money for a very short timeline project, then you'd be more concerned than if the project was a nine-month project and they only had 20000 or 30000 or $40,000 more to raise versus a million dollars more to raise. Well, let's, let's talk Those are just things that so the board well, has to let, let's assume well, well, what Peabody. risk they let's, want to let's take. Read, let's, let's hear the history of the Peabody loan. And, and, uh, and we just had expressions earlier tonight that yeah. we're getting it back $50,000 at a time. Uh, how long did it take from the time the money was lent before we got it back? But that's the point, is that that was a, a poor system that was in place then, which well, didn't well, have the system. Or, or, or poor financial 
Well, no, that, no, no, no. It was the, the, the it was board. it was the system that didn't have the seventy five percent at that point. Is that, that is that, that correct? Prior, it, that was prior to, to this, this policy. So it was it about was, three years ago. It was prior to this policy, and it was during a time when there was a change in a CBO and a director of facilities. And so a, combi and it, a combination of all a combination of all three of those and yeah. under had this, some play. And under this policy, some success. It's it's worked out. It, uh, everything has worked, worked pretty out. well, except on one occasion when we had a project that came in much more expensive than anticipated. The pool. I, yeah. yeah. And that's that's just that and that that could have happened well, if it was a building instead of a pool. I mean, construction costs you know, that's, just that's a good example. Went way up. I mean. Uh, when those bids came in, we couldn't go forward until we had the assurance that we had the money. And actually, it did work in that case, and that was a case where the uh, initial estimate uh, was way off from the final bid amount. Correct. And, well, we had, and, and you also we had, had some donors we, come through We did, but we were colors. also ready to pull the plug on it, and had we not had the money come forward, we would have pulled the plug. Mr. Trimble. I love these metaphors yeah. you're using. Yeah. <laughs> Pull the plug. You also have, um, you have both this board and a, a lot of other foundations at a lot of other schools now having watched other groups raise money and watch how all of this happens. So the level of sophistication both for you and, and the uh, nonprofits at the schools has been raised and they know exactly what it is they're getting into. You've also got in the AR here a six month period in which they're on the hook. The, the nonprofit is on the hook. So they go into it eyes wide open. And the six month period really is, is what keeps the dollars real, which was your original point, Dr. Noah. Well, I, I've, made, I've made my point. I, 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 you haven't changed my mind, but I obviously haven't changed yours either, so it doesn't <laughs> matter. Okay. Uh, so we're on to, let's see, we're 1835, we're on the last part, 73, BP 7310. Any comments there? Yes, yes. actually. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, how, uh, here's my question, how are the board policies referred to or incorporated into charter school MOUs? Well, what, what well, you mean independent charter or dependent charter? No, uh, well. But, the we have a neighborhood conversion charter, and then we have uh, uh, a neighborhood school mm -hmm. conversion charter, and then two, you know, from scratch uh, charter schools. To my knowledge, none of the charters have adopted board policies for the charters. They simply have ed code language, and a lot of this applies simply through ed code language, but well, this would be a good example. Well, I, th I think that it's in all of the MOUs that it's very clear that they're using district facilities, correct? Correct. And so whenever you're talking about district facilities, the district they board policy applies. They require approval for any alterations or modifications or additions. Yeah. And we do have that in the MOU, although we consistently mm -hmm. run into difficulties because the charter schools think those are their facilities. Uh, so they may modify the facilities and may ignore our request to to uh, have something designed by code, for example, or take it out. Uh, I mean, it, it does become a problem to us. But it is in the MOU. Oh, yes. Yes. Ms. Harder. No, 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 I'm just, I was, it was, you know, obviously this is, is uh, you know, fresh, the, you know, the naming policy uh, with regard to tonight's discussion. I'm just wondering if there's any way to go back and reinforce, particularly the facilities um, board policies and administrative regs uh, with regard to the charter school MOUs. And I don't know how you do it. I don't know how you would accomplish it. Just this. But I'll, it I'll seems to, to me that that, that We're there's uh, a gap. Yes, I'm not sure I understand what what your issue is exactly. Exactly, exactly what uh, Dr. Sarvis raised that schools come to think of the facilities as their own. They act as if they are their own when in fact the facilities are ours and they are rented to the charter school, and they make modifications. They, they do things with the facilities that don't follow our board policies. 
so in fact, it, you're questioning whether they have the right to name their these our facilities. No, we approved it tonight. But no, the no, point no. of fact, they made the move to name it before it ever came to this board in order to uh, mm -hmm. have that approved in advance. Well, my suggestion would be this. We go through uh, and we have revised and upgraded our agreements with the charters as we renew their charters. Uh, we're currently in the process of renewing the charter for Santa Barbara Charter, with some legal expense to us, by the way, as well as legal expense to Santa Barbara Charter. Uh, they are not a Proposition 90, or 39 school. Um, they're renting facilities. Yet in our MOU, uh, I believe we should have a, a reference, uh, because of what you said, a reference to our board policies so that the, whatever they do is consistent with our board policies on facilities. And as we go through upgrading and revising the other charters for Cesar Chavez in three years' time, I mean, that, it's coming up right away, uh, then we can do the same thing to each of the other schools as we go. We can, but we I can like also make idea. sure that they each have a copy of the updated 7000 series when we um, pass it. Um, Which we can do right now. Yes. <laughs> That's an excellent idea. <laughs> yes. That, that Actually, is a very I'd like good to idea. request exempting uh, just temporarily board policy 7215 and administrative reg 7215. It's the fundraising for purpose of augmenting bond funds. Um, now, I, I, I take to heart the issue that Dr. Noel has raised, and I'm just wondering if we can just think about this one a little bit longer, move forward with the rest, and then bring this one back. Would you like, like to make a motion? Uh, yeah, to approve the uh, 7000 series with the exception of board policy 7215 and administrative reg 7215 um, to uh, be uh, decided upon at a future date. Second. Any discussion? All those in favor? Aye. Aye. Any opposed? No. Passes 5-0. Okay, we get to go back now to our consent agenda to D4. Dr. Noel. Yeah, I, I, would, I would like to, a little more information on this particular uh, case. I'd like to have a chance to look at the IEP and, and, under, and understand better uh, why the particular vendor was uh, selected or service provider was selected. So, Dr. Neal, do you want to do you want to go? Do you want us to? I can't do give, it public. Yeah, right, exactly. That's my point. I, that's the problem. You want information um, privately by going to the special ed department, or? Okay. Why don't, yeah. why don't we get something to you uh, in the confidential part of the board brief this Friday okay. so that there's an explanation of this okay. and sure. then we'll I'm, bring this back to our next meeting. Yeah, I don't know quite how, how to right. ask my questions. I'm a little bit unclear on what information it is that we're looking for, what, what we're, what what we're going to be getting from this. Uh, I believe Dr. Noel wanted to know the rationale for uh, naming an exact provider. I wouldn't, oh. mind, I wouldn't mind reading the IEP. To see what the... I don't the, think um, we can do that. Yeah. Can, we, can we do that? It's a mediation agreement is what this, this is for a special education student for mediation. Okay, that. So that's, yes, that's mm -hmm. something that we can provide. Okay. Okay, so we'll bring this back then. Okay. Thank you. I move to adopt... Uh, oh. Oh. Oh, no, we already did that, right? Yes, yeah, so we're just going to hold this one off until yeah. next time. And so we're coming to the end of our meeting here. And the last things on here are... <laughs> you know what they are. Here they are. Um, coming events, anything else? Board comments and correspondence? future agenda items you want to talk about another meeting yeah I, I uh, as you know I sent it, made a written request for agenda items on yes uh, my, I, my colleagues may not know but I asked to uh, have uh, the three facilities uh, Ortega Street this street this building rather uh, and uh, the Parma that, that we put move those ahead on our agendas so we're not in that position always of 
never have any time, uh, it's irrelevant because it's, it, the, there's not enough time. So if we could move those ahead and start start mm -hmm. getting reports on the feasibility and the and the options. Um, can and I, I just ask a, a quick question? What will they be moved ahead of? <laughs> What will they be moved ahead of? No, are we gonna? Yeah. Is there something else? Are there other things that are equally oh, ab time we sensitive? Have, we have the. Um, well, we wanted to talk about the audit committee and the budget committee, and that had to be postponed from this meeting because Mr. Smith isn't here tonight. So that's of immediate concern. There's a there's a lot of things that are stacked up behind because we were running so late on these last few meetings, but. Um, We'll try. We have an extra meeting at the beginning of June, which should help. If need be, we may need to schedule another meeting in June. I hope we don't have to do that. Is that the sentiment that, that I hear? <laughs> I, I don't know. I just think that if we're talking about ch reordering the priorities of the agenda, that it would be helpful if the rest of the board knew how how that was affecting the other priorities so that well we on know. the board brief you will see the those items so okay. we'll we'll see what gets what has to happen mm -hmm. okay you know mrs cordero i didn't ask that those items be put ahead of some other items i when i use the phrase move ahead i mean to move ahead with that process ah okay I don't really okay or not. oh i didn't understand that at all so i'm glad you've clarified and, that and, thank and you in my request to you i I did refer to the fact that any citizen can come in and have something put on the agenda within three meetings. Uh, so I didn't demand that, uh, but I, gave, I thought it was useful information in terms of timeline. Mm -hmm. It would be nice to, to see us within three meetings at least consider one of these possibilities. Yeah. But you're the you're in charge of the agenda. Yes, we and actually you, and had I'm sure one. You will arrange the agenda. I'll try. I will try my best. Um, we had one of them on the agenda, and it actually fell off this time because of so many other things. It and we did get through everything off. tonight. Yes. May fell I off. address the uh, need for a special meeting by next Tuesday or sooner? We just received the administrative law judge findings on our layoff notices. We still have some outstanding layoff notices. They are due to the reduction of ninth grade class size in math, for example, uh, enrollment decline in the secondary district. And we need the board to meet uh, and act upon those by next Tuesday. It could be Friday, it could be Tuesday. Uh, I think when we asked about Tuesday before, not all five board members could make it. Uh, I don't anticipate that this is something that would need all five board members, but we do need to do that. Otherwise, we cannot enact some of the budget cuts that the board just acted on last Tuesday. So Friday or Tuesday? Um, for me, Friday is better. I was going to say I could probably make it Friday. I could not make it Tuesday. Friday okay for okay. We got three anyways. I think I'm good on Friday. I have to. My calendar's in the other room at the moment. Um, I don't have my calendar. What time are we talking about on Friday? Would, would afternoon? Your pick. <laughs> yeah, I think so. I don't have my calendar with me there, but I'm pretty sure to Friday afternoon would work. Could we, could Julie do this for us on, yeah. for Friday afternoon, different time, you know, we'll give us a time and we'll tell her for a couple options and we'll figure it out. Okay. And I had a question about the June meeting because I uh, got the, I had originally thought that we were trying to schedule it in May. Weren't we trying, weren't we shooting for dates in May and we got we were. We were shooting an for email. dates in May, yeah. we didn't find then, dates um, when all five board members could meet. Right, and then I got a notice saying that we had scheduled it for the third, which I cannot make. Oh, okay. <laughs> I think this also speaks to uh, going back to a board policy that we need to look at again on um, board member attendance at meetings and trying to specify regular versus special meetings because this is this is very difficult 
it, it is because um, we have the the schedule that is put out at the beginning of the year that identifies w every every meeting, and I think we probably all of us try to plan around Could that schedule. Commit to that. But then when we schedule when we try to schedule special meetings, sort it's, of yeah, at, at the last minute. Um, well, it was th the interesting. The thing that was difficult for me was that the June third date just was given to us. We never, I, I never saw anything that that mm -hmm. asked about that. I just got the May dates, and then I thought it was on there, but I'm not sure. So, my my problem is the last couple meetings have gone very late. We had a, and so I have a choice. I have either we don't put very many things on our agenda, we limit public comment, we have more meetings, or we have later meetings, and I'm not sure I like any of those options. Um, well, we could, try to, we could try to limit our comments, but that mm. would be, I mean, I, 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 I don't find know that that's a... We could prioritize some of the items. I mean, my, my priority is just some of the mission statement is not as high as a lot of the other issues. Other See, the reason I wanted to get the mission statement is that we have to do that before we do the goals, and I do think the goals are kind of important. We haven't done it in a while. Maybe that's a disagreement, but um, it just seems like we need to do that to get to the goals, and we are, we're now behind on the goals. Well, it uh, might be worth having a, having a discussion, I mean, putting all the agenda items that we see coming up in the next few meetings um, on the table and I that's a good idea. We would I how we would I uh, prioritize, prioritize them. them. I, that's a good idea. Maybe we'll, we'll agendaize that. <laughs> One more thing for our agenda. <laughs> <laughs> We're going to have to decide if that's a high priority for the agenda <laughs> or not. <laughs> right. Mm-hmm. You, you could easily have a have it impossible for for a board member to get something on the agenda if we put it to a, a vote. And that and that would somehow seem antithetical to the idea of representative government. Well, it just may mean more me meetings then. That's all that I know what to do. Or we could prioritize. And just okay, well we'll think it through <laughs> okay anything else uh, then I That's it. thank you adjourn the meeting